Hello, and welcome back to MetalDisciple.com's Metalheads Podcast. My name is George. And I'm Buke. And boy, did we just have an interesting time or what? Yes, we did. We literally just got off the phone with Brian Slagle from Metal Blade Records. He gave us an incredible interview that we're going to be playing for you here in a little bit. About an hour worth. Yep, just about an hour. So it's going to be a mega huge episode. Amazing, guys. He, We asked him everything from... Uh, he's a huge hockey fan, so we asked him everything from hockey to metal to what happened to this band, that band, to current Metal Blade stuff. You know the current, you know, scene of metal. It's it was a great in- interview. Such a nice guy and such a huge and influential guy. He, you know, he he doesn't want to admit it, but <laughs> come on, he has been such a huge part of metal over the last thirty years. It's ridiculous. So it is a truly an honor to, to speak with him and, and have him on our show. Would you say he was a defining metal fanboy? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean? Back in the day, that when he put out that those first, you know, as we use the term mixtape now, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, he was putting out those metal massacre releases. You know, they were just mixtapes in the sense that he was putting out. Kinda, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump starting bands' careers. Yeah, I mean Metallica. Hello. <laughs> ridiculous good stuff so we'll get to that in a little bit it's early on in some of the episodes i used to give you a count on how many countries we have listeners in and i had to stop doing that because the statistics that i use for the podcast uh once it got to 25 countries it just cut off it was like 25 countries and others and it wouldn't tell me how many there were or who they were or anything like that okay well apparently they've changed how things work now because I just happened to go in there and look at the report for how many countries we've got, and I was it blew my mind. <laughs> I've been, you know, my wife asked me this the other day if she knew our stats or any countries or anything. Fifty-five countries. <laughs> what? We have listeners in fifty-five countries. What? So thank you very much to all of you metal fans around the world who have given us a listen. You bring a tear to my eye. Thanks. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> this or this little. <laughs> basement podcast metal is such a global thing man it is just it's a beautiful beautiful thing and we truly appreciate every single one of you that tunes in to listen to this now, now george i can sit here and try and name 55 countries. Well, i considered going through the list just to give everybody their props but i'm like really who wants to listen to 55? it'll be in the notes it'll be in the podcast <laughs> notes yeah so you know i want to on that topic, I wanted to put out there to all the indie metal bands out there, all the unsigned bands and garages, you can send us your music. And if, obviously, we have to like it. But if we like it, we'll be more than happy to put you on the indie band segment. We'd love to get, you know, bands from all around the world and put them on this show. Talk that, about exposure. Yes, exactly. You know, I like to expose you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, that, that's the, my the biggest thing that gets me off about doing the website and the podcast is telling people about bands that maybe they haven't heard before. It's just, you know, spreading the word, keeping metal alive. So, you know, if you're out there, some small corner, far away corner of the world, far from the United States corner anyway, hit us up with your music. You know, you can email us at george at wearemetalheads.com or uh, buke. buke at wearemetalheads.com or hit us up on the Facebook page, Twitter, whatever. But, you know, let us know you're out there. And again, we're now on Instagram. George is posting some great vinyl pictures at Metalheads Pod. There's a podcast. Podcast. Okay. Metalheads Podcast. Speaking of vinyl, I mentioned that I think it was on the last episode when we went to the Soundgarden mm-hmm. in Baltimore, and I picked up a Nick, several Nick Cave albums on vinyl. I remember vinyl. I looked over my shoulder, and you were digging, and you listed something up, and you were like, hmm? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a big Nick Cave fan. And yesterday, I put on The Boatman's Call Vinyl. You know, put it on there gently, closed it, hit hit the on button, and it started playing. And it was, I've, you know, I've heard it for years on CD and particularly on MP3. And the conversation we had last week about n- uncompressed versus MP3, it just drove that point home. The first song on the album, Into My Arms, it was like the voice of God. It sounded like he was in the room with me. It was so full and rich and clear. It just blew me away. And I was like, this, this here is why I listen to vinyl. That's sweet. That was the first time you had heard Nick Cave on vinyl? Yeah. Well, not, actually, no, that's not true. I do have a couple other ones, but this is one of my favorite albums by him. So it, it's been, I've been is tracking. Is that the album to- you start people with? 
Maybe. Probably. Does that have red right hand or? No, no, no. That shows you my extent of. <laughs> you don't know. No, you don't know any Nick Cave. Come on. <laughs> so you mentioned something about the Metal Sucks article about horrible sales figures or something. Yeah, that was a news story that no album this year, no artist has uh, gone platinum. That's amazing. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. With in a bad way. <laughs> amazing in a bad way with country artists with country music. You know, supposedly being popular. With pop music always being popular. I don't know who's big in pop music right now, but to not sell a million albums is staggering. Yeah, well, I think it was the Metal Sucks podcast that mentioned that Beyonce had the biggest selling album at like 700,000. And comparatively, like Lamb of God, it sold like 250,000, which, you know, compared to on a popularity level, that's, you would think Beyonce being so much more well known and popular around the world that that number would be vastly larger than Lamb of God, and yet Lamb of God gets into the ballpark with Beyonce. So it's a good thing for metal, I think, because me it shows that metal, no matter what, stays strong, and that pop music, meh, whatever. And the reason why I wanted to, I texted you earlier in the week, and why I wanted to bring this up is I wanted to give a nod to Chuck from the Metalheads podcast here and say I really agree with him here, and I didn't text you this because I wanted to save it for the podcast. To the average listener... Try and justify to them going on iTunes and buying an album for nine bucks or justify that Spotify subscription for nine bucks mm -hmm. where you have access to everything. Well, that's the thing. You know, I was listening to them talk about that on and their that's podcast. that's a topic that totally, I was sitting there, I was like, yeah. But not really. Because take, Spotify. Take us out of it. Take a you and I out of it. Okay. Take the average listener who's probably sitting at home sitting in a dorm room, sitting at school, maybe driving in their car to and from work. Sure. And I can understand why that is the way to go for those people. But those are the same people that are listening to compressed MP3 files on crappy Apple earbuds. They are the majority, unfortunately. But at the same time, metal fans are showing that we want more and expect more, and we care more about our music than the average music listener. I have a Spotify account. I use it as my I back. I, I use it as my backup for you know when I don't have something on my phone. But the problem is, while Spotify does have a pretty decent metal selection, I listen to a lot of really obscure stuff. I listen to a lot of unsigned bands. They just don't have a complete. You know, I could not rely on Spotify to get by. They just don't have all the things that I want to listen to. Yes, but the obscure metal bands aren't you aren't getting hundreds or thousands of plays. No, that. You know, that Slug Doom band we listened to. Slug. <laughs> yeah, I love those guys. That's awesome. If, if those guys are getting 500 plays, they're probably lucky. Again, that's, I'm not, that's not talking bad about them. Mm -hmm. That's just saying that's how obs obscure they are. Right. It doesn't make a difference physical, digital. They're just not getting listens. Right. And so I'm just saying that, you know, while Spotify is an okay backup to have on hand, I really much prefer to have my own physical or at least digital copies of things so that I can access them when I want them, where I want them. I'm still waiting around for a service that has everything th that lets me connect to my music collection to stream my music collection to my phone whenever I want to. And if I don't have an, an internet connection, I can I can download it like you would with Spotify. Over, over the years, you've sent me a couple of startups that have, remember we've thought they're, they're going to be that? Yeah, there's, there's been a few, and but I haven't found one that's really worked all that well. Yeah. Uh, Subsonic is the one I've been using lately, and it, it just it never connects. I can't get to my stuff. And because so many people are just going to use Spotify instead, nobody's probably ever going to get me that you know, program that I'm looking for, you know, the real yeah. hardcore music fans, you just got to make do with what you can. And, and but the discussion here that they were having is though, is that that's not, and that this article was talking about is that's not the, but that's not the music industry now. No, it, but we aren't the music industry. Metal is apart from the music industry. It, it is a part of the music industry. And yet it is apart from like even Brian, Brian Slagle's bands are on a different tier than those obscure bands who you want to listen to. Sure. So there's no... I just came away from this interview. Again, it solidified my point that the average listener doesn't care. Yeah. Period. No. They want access uh, 
the term that comes to mind, spoiled. That's the way that people are about yeah. everything, Days. It's not just music. It's They want it's, everything it's, now. They want... Con- they want to go on Netflix. They want seasons one through six, every, every episode. Dead Kennedys, give me convenience or give me death. Yeah. They want everything right, right away. Yeah. And that's how music is now. The music industry is not going to pull out from this. It's not, there's no, there's not going to be a fix to this in the sense that they're not going to turn this around sales wise. Yeah. How do you, how do you come out from this? Well, like Brian was just saying in the interview, and you'll hear later, the, the music industry has to adapt and find new ways of generating revenue. You know, there's always a way. It's just you have to find the way that works. You know, digital music and the MP3 is not, it's not the death blow to the music industry. It's certainly, a virus that has, you know, infected and, and diseased the music industry, but it won't wipe it out. There's, you know, somebody will come up with a way to make it work and eventually things will balance. Obviously, it's unlikely that things will be the way they used to be where you had the excess rock star, what have you, you know, and the big glamour and flashy and throwing money everywhere. You know, those days are probably over, but in terms of, a balance where artists can make a living and the labels can make a living, it, it'll equalize eventually. Either that or a wall fucked. <laughs> CD sales, like DVD sales, are going to keep going down. Yeah, and vinyl sales keep going up. Yeah, Not but, enough to keep but, anybody, you know, but putting be, food on the table, but... Be honest, at that, the number for vinyl sales is still percentile small. Yeah. Yeah, they said it's gone up 50%, but that 50% of jack shit is still jack shit. So, <laughs> so that's that's where we're all, the music industry right now. But let me ask you an interesting question. Do, do you think, I should have asked Brian this, do you think metal cares? Because in the sense that, yes, no one's platinum. But aside from these big metal artists, no metal artist is platinuming anyway. Right. Well, I mean, artists used to get platinum albums. You know, few of them anyway, in terms of metal, but it, it just brings the, the 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 median level down for everybody. So you know, those that were you know making a million dollars before, they're making two hundred fifty thousand now. People were making two hundred fifty thousand before, they're making fifty thousand now. Those that were making fifty thousand now aren't making anything. So it's tough, but you know, it's got, it's got it's either it's got to equalize at some point. Or the whole thing's just going to cave in. But again, like like to bring it back home, what Chuck brought up, the music industry right now is, and I totally agree for agree. There's no reason to buy something when you can have access to everything. Nope, not nope. not for us. I'm saying not for us. To my wife who listens to shit music, mm-hmm. she does. And I tell her all the time, even though she's not home, she hasn't bought anything since she was in in sync back in high school. Yeah. She doesn't care about buying anything, but if she pays that $9 a month and she can stream and bounce around from this track, from this artist, this track here, that's why you got to add value. You got to, you know, do something that makes people want to invest more in it. You know, the vinyl, the, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't, if I knew the answer, I I would, I would be like, Hey, let's do this and (laughs) save the industry. But you know, there's got to be other ways to make money. I think us as metal fans are different to us. The value is in the music. Now, hold my hand. The value is in the music as a product itself. Sure. The, the, you know, it's in track one through 10. That's the value to my wife. Hey, it's just three minutes of a song. So let them kill their pop stars off. Next thing you know, the top 200 is going to be all metal. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because we'll be the ones standing there at the end going, hey, we supported our artists. We have. We have. Yep. Yeah. Luckily, people like you and I, we don't make any money doing this, so it doesn't hurt us at all. <laughs> hey, but if anybody wants to sponsor us, please. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to make some money doing this, but uh, we have yet to see any. So I kind of wanted to segue into something that I think it was actually the Jamie Josta podcast was talking about when he was interviewing uh, Eddie Trunk, which, my God, that was a cool podcast. Isn't his podcast? I told you to listen oh, I to love, it. It's great, isn't it? I, I will give you credit. Buke has been a hardcore hate breed fan for years. For, Thank you. And I have been a meh hate breed fan. This is fan. going back to early 2000. I, I've never disliked hate breed. You know, I... Hardcore has just never been my thing. 
It's not that I don't like it. It just doesn't hold my interest very long because it's not because ter- you, you can't handle the pit. No, it's not terribly dynamic and not at all. You know, <laughs> but I will give Jamie Josta props. After you know, I've been listening to his podcasts for a few weeks now, and I've been listening to all his albums now because I'm like, he's so cool. I got to listen to his music. And let me tell you, while hardcore does not necessarily have a lot of dynamic range, a with a with a name like Hatebreed, that of course he he keeps talking about how much negativity they get because of it. <laughs> yeah, there was someone on the news. Remember months back, they were being branded as like a skinhead hate band. <laughs> yeah, but his lyrics are so uplifting and empowering yes. that I'm like, hell yeah, this is Hatebreed. All right, <laughs> you know, and and so I've really been enjoying his music and and his podcast too. And like I said, it's not fair, you know, he has music and a podcast. But anyway. Getting back on point, he was interviewing Eddie Trunk, and they were talking about Avenged Sevenfold and Five Finger Death Punch as, like, gateway bands. You know, we, a lot of metal fans, serious, hardcore, true cult metal fans, probably rag on bands like Avenged Sevenfold and Five Finger Death Punch. I've done it, you've probably done it, and we feel like that's okay. And whatever, you know, your musical taste is what your musical taste is. However, they made a good point that... People got to start somewhere, you know, when, the, the kids coming up, they're not going to jump right into Cannibal Corpse. They're not going to be like, oh, yeah, I like uh, Justin Bieber. I'm like 12 and then like 13 years old. I'm looking for something a little harder. Let's see. Cannibal Corpse. No, no. They need a gateway. And so as much as we might despise bands like they were talking about on the Metal Sucks podcast, Avenged Sevenfold and the whole Metallica Guns N' Roses ripoff thing. But... Avenged Sevenfold, they're bringing the kids in, they're putting the butts in the seats, and even if we are like, er, we hate those mall metal kids, some percentage of those kids spin off into, spin off into something a little heavier. Like Slipknot. Yeah, like Slipknot, right. and, and, and they work their way up, and I actually, I, was, I didn't have a chance to flush this out, because I just thought about it in the car in the morning today. Uh, this is like metal ecosystem of how... Uh, you progress from a beginner to a seasoned metalhead. And I related it to like the level of like drugs, <laughs> not perhaps the most positive way, but again, this was just something I thought of while I was driving. This is from George's personal experience. <laughs> no, um, you know, you've got a band like Avenged Sevenfold, and that's like a kid who's like experimenting with smoking. Okay. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> Puff, puff, puff. Okay, Avenged Sevenfold. So not in in inhaling. That's kind of that's kind of cool. And then from there they move up a little bit. Maybe they try weed and they're like, "Mm, Five Finger Death Punch. That's a little heavier than the cigarette. I like that, you know. And that leads to something heavier. Next thing you know, they're dropping acid and it's listening to something heavier than that. Yeah, but who is that acid band? Is that like Emperor? That's what I I didn't have time to flush out one for each level. I was like, this is acid. This is cocaine. Finally, you're like me. You're at the crack heroin level where you're listening to the weirdest shit. You know, the most underground, <laughs> obscure stuff. You just got the needle in your arm and you're just so out of it. You're you're, hurt. <laughs> yeah, I'm you're like, just, I you're can't, listen to tweaker pads. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get off on my metal unless I'm listening to the weirdest, most obscure, <laughs> underground Russian black metal crazy it's stuff. It's a one-man you know? project. He has three, three ant long. He has an arm and two legs missing. Yeah, and, and it's just like, you know, but... Like you said, you got to start somewhere. Maybe that's a, a, a horrible, you know, no, just like bad years, way of looking at no, it. No, you gave me crap for years because Pantera was my gateway drug, in a sense, using your drug reference. And, and, but, and it's, no, but it's you always w- said that Pantera was that redneck, oh, Pantera, you know. It always annoyed me that all the, you know, white, small town jock football player <laughs> guys were like, I like Pantera. And that was like, that was their thing. And they didn't really know anything about metal. They were just like trying to be cool because it was heavy. And they I heard feel, walk a couple of times. And I feel the same way about Hatebreed. I look at Hatebreed fans and I'm like, okay, I like the music, but their fans, they're a bunch of fucking morons. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But they look like people that would annoy me. Except me. Except, well, they look just like you. That's the thing. <laughs> yes, you do. are the small town football player. I am. <laughs> Hillbilly boy. It's <laughs> like, I like Pantera, but damn, I like hate breed. But you know, I, I, I'm not trying to insult Pantera or hate breed fans. It was just that. That's a good point. Though. For me, it was like, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. You like metal, sure you do. You like that, and that's it. 
And so I, it was a little condescending is probably the best way to look at it. I'm like, why don't you listen to some real metal? That's, that is real metal. But why don't you listen to some more metal than just that? See, but the thing is, though, you have to listen to those bands because if you start with the Cannibal Corpse, right, you're just like, ooh. I remember I went over to my friend's house. I was like, I told her on episode one, I went over to my friend's house, sophomore year in high school. He put on Bolt Thrower. This is before I listened to metal. Mm -hmm. He put on Bolt Thrower. I said, what the fuck is this? Yeah. I, I turn this shit off. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, we have to keep in mind, even though we're more seasoned and we we know a lot about metal, people got to start somewhere. And so, you have whether you like it or not, you have to kind of accept that these bands exist to get other people yeah. into it. And I was listening to the Jamie Josta podcast with uh, Ivan Moody, and I had kind of been, I'd kind of fallen out of love with Five Finger Death Punch with their third album, American Capitalist. I haven't listened to them since... I, li- I really liked their first album, Way the Fist. Second album, War is the Answer. I liked it, there were f- but, but not quite as much. American Capitalist, I, I hated it. The production, and I listened to it again today to, to be sure, and I was like, the production just wasn't all that good. The songs were just kind of mediocre, and, and so I was like, bah, Five Finger Death Punch, whatever. And then I listened to their new al- like two-part album, and I'm like, okay, this is... I'm falling back in love with the band now. The production was much better. The songs were better. And whatever you say, you got to admit that Ivan Moody has got an incredible voice. He does a really good hardcore, you know, but at the same time, he can sing like a mother and he's got an incredibly distinct, clean vocal voice. You hear Ivan Moody singing clean and you're like, that's Ivan Moody. There's no question about it. You know it. So I mean, see, I can't speak on that because I haven't listened to a hard rock Band like I would consider Five Finger Death Punch to since Seven Dust. Nah, it's nowhere even near. I mean, Seven Dust is not doesn't even come close. I mean, really, that shows you how. That's the thing is that disconnected I am. Then you know, Five Finger Death Punch does some like cleaner ballady type songs that are probably the ones that are getting on the radio and getting them the attention. But then they still do some really heavy stuff like uh, Dot Your Eyes and uh, some some other songs that are just like, wow, well, you know, they're still doing some really heavy stuff. They're not just like, oh, we're just going to do ballads now. So I'm back on I'm back on their side again. So I hear you've been cheating on me with hockey. <laughs> yeah, I uh, for any as you're here in the Slagle pod, sorry, in the Slagle interview, I uh, also help out with a blog at Talk the Red. It's a Washington Capitals blog. And uh, we do, we cover the Capitals. We do Twitter, Facebook, and everything. I got my first taste of uh, what it's like to be media for a uh, pro sporting event. This totally blindsided me, by the way. Absolutely amazing. I knew he was doing stuff, but he's like sending me pictures going, look, I'm on the press box. Look, I'm interviewing the coach. Look. You show up at Verizon Center. You go to the media entrance. They're like, oh, hello, sir. They give you your media badge. You walk underground, go up the elevator to the press box. Mm-hmm. All the food and drink you could want. That can be hungry. <laughs> yeah, you grab all your stat sheets and uh, go and sit down at your table. You plug your laptop in <laughs> and watch the game. And then when it's done, you walk in the locker room and you have uh, access to the whole team. Were their Johnsons hanging out? No, they were still in there. They had literally just taken their pads off. They're still breathing heavy. You know, they're. This is literally like minutes after they're off the ice. Yeah. Uh, Why don't they give the guys time to like I, breathe a little? You know. I don't know, but they're still breathing heavy. They're still sucking down water. Uh, it's crazy. It's a crazy experience to go from the ultimate fan mm-hmm. to <laughs> here I am in the locker room talking to these guys. I know, you know. Me, I'm never starstruck by meeting anybody, but uh, amazing to have the full attention of these guys. Like we've said before, to have the full attention of these people holding a re- recorder mm-hmm. in their face and asking them questions, and they're giving the full time to us. That's really nice. It's, it's pretty cool. So it'll be an ongoing thing for me. So if anybody's a hockey fan, if anybody's a Washington Capitals fan out there, uh, you can follow me at Opeth Fan and uh, follow us at Talk the Red. Uh, we're a Washington Capitals blog. Diehard hockey fan, George and I are. Right on. All right. Well, by the time this podcast posts, 
it will be almost November, which means it's starting to come up on the time of year that makes me kind of sad. That's the time of year when the releases kind of slow down. Now, this year, November is actually going to be pretty busy. I've seen that there's going to be a ton of releases coming out in November, which is good. But once December hits, it just slows down. And I spend a month going, come on, I need a new release. I need, you know, I'm a junkie needing my fix. I need my I need my heroin and my crack. And so December is kind of a, a bummer time for me. <laughs> Aside from the holidays and all that, blah. But, you know, I'm like, I need new music. But then January comes around and people start putting out more music and, and I'm happy again. And the cycle of life repeats. Yeah, video games kind of have that drop off too around Christmas time this December. Yeah. All right, well... I think we, this is this is kind of new for us. Why before we get into the news stories and the new releases and stuff, why don't we take oh I don't know an hour and listen to the Brian Slagle interview now? All right, so check this out, and then there'll be plenty more afterwards. Let me tell you. All right, see you on the other side. Welcome to MetalDisciple.com's Metalheads Podcast. My name is George. And I'm Buke. We are here today with Brian Slagle from Metal Blade Records. How you doing? Pretty good. Uh, we're doing great today, buddy. Uh, Brian, I first have to jump in and start by asking you, you know, as anyone who uh, follows you online, like myself, uh, George and I are both avid uh, hockey fans. As anybody who watches hockey and follows hockey knows, you are kind of like the uh, journeyman of the hockey world. When when did you first get into hockey? It seems like you've gone everywhere now. Yeah, pretty. I think so at this point. I, I got into it when I was a kid. Uh, I, obviously, being from L.A., people always ask me, how did you get into hockey? But when I grew up, there were a lot of hockey rinks. It was kind of – I grew up in the 70s, and this is when in, in L.A. they started building hockey rinks everywhere. So it became kind of a big thing for a minute. So I got into it then. Uh, but I didn't really kind of get become fanatical about it until the early 80s when uh, – a friend of mine, this is this is the state of the LA Kings in the early 1980s, so he was doing printing work for the Kings, and instead of paying him, they gave him two season tickets, <laughs> and he he never went to the game, so he, he said, hey, you want these tickets? And I said, sure, and they were like five rows up from the ice in the corner, these amazing tickets, so I just eventually took them from him, and they became my tickets, and that began my uh, complete insanity of hockey. Were you there when the Kings brought in the great one? Absolutely. I was there for every single game that Wayne Gretzky played in Los Angeles. Man, you lucky, lucky guy. That was uh, amazing. Like you and I have talked back and forth on Twitter. And by the way, if the people listening to the podcast don't follow you, follow Brian Slagle at Brian Slagle on Twitter. He's absolutely awesome. You've been to, it seems at this point, almost every arena, even though I keep trying to get you to a Caps game here. Where have you been to where one has been the most enjoyable and where haven't you, you been to? Well, I've been to a game in every single hockey city, and I've been to every arena except for the new Buffalo Arena, okay, the new St. Louis Arena, and uh, uh, and Raleigh. Those are the only three I have not been to in terms of the, the newer arenas. Um, best arenas, and I've also been to a million junior games and college games and you name it. I've been to the World Junior Tournament six times. I've been to the Frozen Four, the college hockey tournament, eight times. But yeah, I'm, uh, I've been around. <laughs> <laughs> are uh, Philly fans as bad as they uh, say they are? I would grade oh, – that's a hard thing to say. The Philly, because fans, I... the Philly fans are pretty bad. I, I, I will give you that. Although it's they're not as bad now because – you know, the ever since the ticket sales went up and they built that new arena there, it's if you're sitting in the right spots, it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. But yeah, yeah they're crazy. But you know, I used to be. Yeah, I don't really hate too many teams. I, I hate <laughs> styles of of play. I, so I, I hate boring clutch and grab sort of hockey. So the Minnesota Wild and the St. Louis Blues come to mind right now as teams that I don't like to watch. Yeah, the Habs. <laughs> Although the Habs can be fun sometimes, but yeah, they kind of play that style. So, um, so yeah, I, I kind of I kind of do that. But I used to hate the Flyers. Like for, for my entire existence, I hated the Flyers. Yeah. I'm a big Penguins guy, so... <laughs> What? Um, yeah, but I also love the Caps. So I, yeah, have a lot of, I have I have a lot of allegiances. I'm the only guy in Los Angeles who likes both the Kings and the Ducks too. So yeah, you know, Ducks have our old coach there, Bruce uh, Boudreau. So yeah, who's great? I, I pull for him too. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, 
and I used to hate the Flyers, and then the Kings all of a sudden traded all these guys that I loved on the Kings, Braden Shen, Wayne Simmons, all to the Flyers, and a couple other guys that I know that I liked went to the Flyers. So all of a sudden, it's hard for me to hate the Flyers now. Now, on a side note here, talk about hockey. You yourself do a hockey and metal podcast. That's correct, right? Yeah, I do it with Sean Rourke, who runs NHL.com. I've been doing it for three years now. It's called Metal Misconduct. You can go to iTunes and, and check it out. And we basically talk to athletes who are metalheads and there's tons of hockey guys and major league baseball guys nfl guys mma all over the place it's a lot of fun because you get these guys and you know you you see i mean you guys know you, you see hockey players interviewed all the time and they're usually the most boring interviews athletes in general are pretty boring but when we get them on the show and they start talking about music it's a whole different world it's really fun that sounds awesome i'm going to be checking that out for sure that's always nice to hear when there's you know athletes that like metal whenever we meet any of the caps we're like hey you know alex ovechkin what do you like and they're all into like oh you know techno euro pop and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know there's and, not a lot of players in the metal but there's a few and like wasn't it you that, uh, yeah i you? asked i asked i asked the famous story between george and i i asked nick backstrom of course from sweden yep. if backstrom knew my favorite band opeth of course he looked at me like i told him i uh yeah. You who, know, who? Yeah. <laughs> who are you? What was that? Uh, but, you know, quick hockey player that comes to mind who knows metal. Have you met Dan Boyle? Absolutely. Yeah, I know uh, he's a huge metalhead, right? Yeah, I've hung out with him a few times. In fact, he's always wearing a Metal Blade record shirt. That's so, awesome. Yeah, Which I must say, probably one of the best logos around. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fun logo. It's, we, just, we just lifted it from some pirate stuff, but it looks cool. <laughs> Do you still own that uh, hockey team? No, you know, I've I've been in I, I never owned a team fully, but I was involved in a few teams over the years and every sing, in the in the minor leagues obviously, and every single one of them has gone bankrupt. So, uh, and I used to also be involved in the Central Hockey League as an investor in in the company that owned that and of course they've gone away too. So, I don't own anything anymore. <laughs> What do you think, and this always comes up among hockey fans, and actually you ask non-hockey fans why they watch hockey, what do you think about fighting, and does fighting have a place in hockey? Well, absolutely. I mean, I'm an old school guy when it comes to that. I think that the players need to police themselves, because people always ask me, like, well, why, why do they allow fighting? No other sports allow fighting. Yes, but hockey is the only sport where you carry a weapon in your hand. So if you don't have fighting, then guys are going to get hurt. And I think that you've seen ever since the instigator rules been been gotten rid of, or you know, the, given the the two minute penalty, you have seen a major. I feel you've seen a major increase in stars getting hurt. I mean, Sidney Crosby, the Penguins. Like, I mean, when, when Greg Gretzky was here in L.A., he had Marty McSorley there. And if you even went near Gretzky and breathed on him, you were in trouble. And now a lot of guys don't have that fear so they can take on the star players thus you're seeing pretty much every star player getting hurt for significant amounts of time if the instigator in my opinion if the instigator rule was not there and you didn't get a penalty then i think you'd see a lot of that stuff not be around so i definitely think it's there but you also see the writing on the wall i mean it's 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 getting out of the game you see a guy like george peros you know who's who's not able to play anymore because that, that role is just gone. You know, they need every team needs every guy on that on that roster to be able to skate and score now. So I think it's kind of just getting out of the game as it is anyway. Yeah, you know, and plus you see so much with, you know, head injuries and brain injury stuff that, you know, I think that that's where why they're trying to take it out. Yeah, I mean, I get that a little bit. Uh, you know, we talked about Paris. I mean, he kind of, you know, got hurt in a fight. But, you know, rarely guys, rarely do guys really get hurt in a fight like that. But but then again, you never know. I mean, you, you look at guys like Probert and some of these other guys who fought a lot and had had problems later on. It's definitely uh, it's definitely a tough issue. But I guess if you want, if you like fighting, you have to go to the Quebec League and watch that. <laughs> okay, so here we sit. Already, you're, the Kings have played six games already, you know, sit in second place with nine points. The Kings, you guys playing a tough, tough Pacific. How do you see the rest of the season playing out for you guys? Well, you know, I thought that the Kings, I mean, t Kings never play very well in the regular season for whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, they, they'll be good enough to get into the playoffs. But I think right now it's really a huge question mark with this whole Voinoff thing. It depends on how that plays out because he, he's by far their second best defenseman next to Dowdy. And him not being in the lineup is a massive hole for that team. And not only that, that's a very tight knit group. And you see a guy do something like that. I don't know how that's going to affect the players. Moving forward as well, if he does come back, how does that affect it? I mean, that's a really big question mark there. So that you know that really could hurt that team an awful lot. So we have to see where 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 that goes, I guess. Now, on the side note about King fans, you know, you think non -tra traditional hockey market. How are the turnout for Kings games now? I know you know they've seen Stanley Cup success the past couple of years. 
you know, they've been selling out ever since they moved to Staples Center. They've sold out uh, almost every game. I think they're on like they're on a, a streak similar to the Caps, like 400 or something crazy in straight sellouts there. So it, it does really well. They, they were smart when they moved to Staples Center in downtown L.A. Because, you know, over the years it's been, you know, before Gretzky came here, there was about 6,000 people that went to the, to the Kings games. And then when Gretzky showed up, you had sellouts. Then when Gretzky left, you went back to the five or 6,000. Then they moved to Staples Center. And they did a lot of marketing to, like, beach cities and kind of skater kids and all the all the youths that youth got out around about 10 years ago. And that's really paid off because every, every, every one is sold out now. You can't get tickets. Now, going back to our caps here, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys played in an outdoor game last year, correct? Yeah, Dodger Stadium, Caps. Yep. Uh, caps this year play at Nationals Park against the Blackhawks. You know, a couple of years ago, I was at Pittsburgh at Heinz Field when we paid the Penguins, and it was an amazing experience. The NHL has kind of taken the, you know, it used to be the one time a year Winter Classic used to be the game, you know, the special New Year's Day game. Do you think the league is kind of doing wrong in kind of taking out the outdoor game and kind of making it that four or five time a year thing now? I actually don't mind it. I think it's kind of fun. I mean, because they probably never would have done that in L.A. had we not had five or six different games. And there's one in San Francisco this year, too. So I like that they're doing it. I think I mean, we'll have to see how the, how long the novelty lasts. I mean, it may stick. It may not stick. Uh, but I think it's cool. I think it's cool. They can have I think they should have I think every team should have one game outdoors a year. That'd be fine with me. I think they're probably doing it to, you know, expand on, you know, the the hockey fan base. The f- hockey needs more to get it out to the masses because, you know, like uh, football and baseball are obviously the bigger sports in, in America. And hockey is kind of like the, the second rate sport that, you know, not as many people are into. And so I think something like this really helps to get it, give it more visibility with a lot more people, perhaps. Absolutely. I mean, anything they can do to promote the league, they're going to do it. And clearly they're making a lot of money, too, because all these every one of these stadium games sells out. And that's, you know, anywhere from 50 to 60, 70,000 tickets for one game. So, the, you know, the owners love that as does the league. But it's funny. I was talking with some friends of mine last week when this whole Voinoff thing happened about how pretty much everybody has said, oh, look at Gary Bettman, what a great job he did. He did the right thing. The NHL knows what they're doing and kind of got all this really positive press. I, uh, friends of mine were talking, it's like, wow, would it be scary? Because the NFL, and I'm a huge football fan, but they've kind of made a lot of missteps lately. And if they're not careful, they're going to tumble down. Just like baseball used to be the national pastime, the biggest sport in, in America for years and years and years. And then between the strikes and the steroids, it's kind of fallen down to three. You have NFL 1, NBA 2, and then Major League Baseball is third now. So the NFL is not careful. They're going to tumble out of that spot. We were kind of thinking, like, wow, what if, what if the NHL actually started rising up the ranks and, and became a, a huge sport? I'm not sure if I'd like that or not. You know, for those people listening who don't know, uh, Suava Vainoff uh, for the Kings, I know I butchered his name, his first name always gets me, was accused of a domestic violence incident the other day, and the uh, league quickly came in and suspended him right away. Uh, so that's where we're at there. Yeah, so I guess I should have explained that more. No, that's <laughs> that's fine. Uh, now, maybe I wanted to, you know, we're transitioning to, you know, talking music here in a little bit, but... I just wanted to ask you this, since you know you look, you mentioned football and the whole Ray Rice thing, and how long Baltimore took. In this current day and age we live in, and how you know crimes in general, especially you know these crimes against women, are getting so much press. Do you, in the position you sit in, Brian, has this kind of changed the way you look at the artists underneath you going forward? Well, I mean, we've been, you know, we've been really lucky over the years where we've had very, very few problems with any artist. We've only had a couple. Like I think we only had three artists in the 33 years we've been doing this ever put in jail at all. So we've been really lucky about that. We try to work with good people. So uh, I mean, you know, we we and and just in general, the metal community, you don't see a lot of this stuff there. Uh, but if you do, you know, these things happen. I mean, uh, clearly our our world is very much against that sort of stuff. Uh, any sort of violence, you know, violent, obviously domestic violence is a huge problem too. So, you know, we've always been pretty vehemently against that. And if we were to have anybody we work with do something like that, especially if they get arrested, I mean, that would be the end. We would not work with that person any longer, no matter how many records they sold. So it's kind of interesting that you see this on a, on a sports scale where, you know, these guys have been basically getting away with it for a, a long time until finally this video came out for the Ray Rice thing. Yeah. Now, fans here in this D.C. metro area and Baltimore area, you know, they lined up in droves to, you know, sell back their jerseys to the team and all that stuff. How have Kings fans been reacting to this news? 
Uh, you know, it's it's been it's been pretty quiet. I mean, the Kings, even though we talk about them selling out every game, it's not they're not. Uh, you know, when you have the Dodgers and and all this, you know, talk about some football teams moving here, the Kings aren't huge news. So it's out there, but I haven't. You know, you haven't seen what happened with the Ray Rice thing quite yet here in L.A. Uh, I'm not really sure. They, I, I don't think they've. I think tonight is the first home game they've played since it happened. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of the response has been so far. But clearly, if you look at social media, you know, every, every Kings fan is pretty, you know, horrified by what had happened. Now, I, my friends and I always talk. You know, no matter what the team is. When I saw, uh, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank, your guy's captain. Dustin Brown? Yeah, when I saw Dustin Brown, like I do every team, raising that cup a couple years ago, it gives me goosebumps. Were you actually there for those games when they were raising the cup? In 2012, I was not. I was, <laughs> it shows you how, how much, even though I'm a big hockey fan, it shows you I know nothing about hockey <laughs> sometimes. I was very much against that team, I thought, because I had heard of horror stories about Carter and Richards, and then they traded, you know, I talked about Philly, they traded Simmons and Shan, who I really loved, who I thought, who I think are great players and had a really great future with the Kings. And they made all these trades, and and I just thought that they, I thought all those trades were terrible. I thought this team is ruined. They've made all these dumb trades. They're not going to do anything. Then lo and behold, here they start marching through the Stanley <laughs> Cup. And I had scheduled, not thinking that you know anything was going to happen in, this, in the Stanley Cup playoffs. I was scheduled to be in New York right when the finals were. And they, they went a little late that year, too. And then I was leaving for Europe for two weeks, basically on the last day. So I, I the only game I went to that year uh, for the Kings was the Kings Devils in New Jersey, game five, which they won. And then they won game six, and I was on a plane the next day, so I didn't get to see any of the, you know, all the post-game stuff, all the parades, all that sort of stuff. So in 2012, I missed everything. Fast forward to 2014, I went to every Ducks-Kings game. I went to all five of the Stanley Cup final games, including the two New York games. I went to, like, the, the, you know, the parade in Hermosa Beach and all that stuff. So I got to at least do all that stuff in 2014, so. That's awesome. The Kings, just to have you know, will always be my second team now because over the summer my wife and I welcomed our first child and I was sitting there in the hospital holding my baby for the first night as the Kings were winning their Stanley Cup. Ah, nice. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. So uh, the Kings will always be special. And she'll probably grow up now being a Kings fan. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess it's <laughs> destiny, oh, right? Exactly. George and I talked about this last week uh, when you may were mentioning Wayne Simmons. When when he left the Kings, do you stay a fan of his or you're like, ah, you play for the Flyers now. Screw you, buddy. No, no, no. I I remained a big fan of his and, and Shan as, as well. I, you know, I, I'm not like a, I'm not like a lot of the East Coasters, especially New York fans. Like New York fans are like, I'm only Giants or Jets or Rangers or others, whatever. And that's it. And if anybody leaves, I hate them. But I, I've never been that way. If, if, if I like a player and he goes to some other team, I'm still going to like the player. I like the way the style that he plays. So I'm, I, I'm a huge Alexander Ovechkin fan. Always have been. I, it doesn't matter where he plays. I'm always going to root for him. That's. Because you weren't born in Canada, right? Canada hates him. Yeah, yeah, well, I know. <laughs> God, they hate him. Uh, it's this is going to be a, a odd question here, but Caps game entertainment, uh, Caps game. They tweet you a lot on Twitter. Uh, they tweet. They play a lot of Metal Blade artists at Caps games and stuff. Do you travel around? And have you noticed a lot of stadiums since metal is that you know heavy music and hockey is that hard hitting sport? Where's the most heavy metal arena? you've been to well I, I haven't been you know since it's the, i've been to a bunch of caps games but i haven't been there since they've been playing the music there in fact i went uh th- i want to say two years ago to, i'm trying to remember it was two or three years ago i actually went with Johan, uh the singer from all my martha's wife because his wife is a huge capitals fan so we went to a couple games there and they played some some metal but not like it is now uh pittsburgh is really good the guy that that Plays the music in Pittsburgh is a huge metal head. He actually works for a um, metal record label called Willow Tip. So they're really good. Uh, Anaheim is great. They play tons and tons of metal. Uh, New Jersey, I'm not sure. I haven't been, to, I didn't go to New Jersey last year, but, but but they used to have a guy there that played a lot of stuff. In fact, they played a lot of Martha, New Jersey before. And uh, Chicago's pretty good. I'm trying to think. Uh, there's one, oh, Dallas is good. They have, they still come out to the, Pan, Pantera wrote their theme songs. So they still come out to that. So those are all the ones that, that are pretty predominantly metal. So I just heard the other day that the Minnesota Wild uh, have adopted Hammerfall's Fury of the Wild as their intro song when they come out onto the ice. Yeah, you know, somebody did tell me that, and I think that they somebody said that they're playing some metal up there as well, So, which is kind of too bad because that team is so poor. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, we're going to uh, transition here. George has uh, some metal questions for you that uh, we've been putting our heads together for. Yes, sir. 
All right, well, I'm going to fanboy out on you for a second here. I've been listening to Metal Blade music for like 30 years now, so one of my earliest metal memories was uh, in the 80s. I picked up a copy of The Best of Metal Blade Volume 1 on LP. Nice. And that was the first time that I ever heard about bands like Slayer and Trouble, Celtic Frost, Voivod, Metal Church, Omen, Fate's Warning. I mean, all these great bands, Warlord, Attacker. I mean, I, I named my Metal Disciple website after the song Disciple that was on that LP. And I just wanted to thank you for all the inspiration that that has given me over the years. Oh, man, no problem. Thanks for the, the, the support. I mean, that's, you know, I'm just ultimately just a fan. And it, the most fun for me is just turning people on to, to good music. So that's, that's awesome. Right on. What are some of the bands that are exciting you to work with right now? Well, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, you know, all the big stuff is fun. You know, Monomarth, Cannibal Course, Black Dahlia, Between the Bear and Me, all, all that stuff. But there's an a interesting kind of newer sort of scene that's, that harks and, harkens back to that early 80s style that these young kids are, are doing. Uh, there's a band that we signed from Salt Lake City, of all places, called Visigoth, V-I-S-I-G-O-T-H. And they sound, they're young 20s kids, and they sound like they came, they sound like they came from 1982, 83. It's Man of War, Metallica, Maiden, Priest, all that sort of style stuff. And I'm, just, I'm obsessed with their new record. There's a song up now on uh, iTunes or Spotify or any of the streaming services uh, of their first single. And then the record's coming out in January. So I'm super excited about that. Because there's been a lot of European bands kind of doing that sort of stuff. We have bands like Portrait and Solitude that are doing that kind of old school metal sort of thing. But this is the first kind of US band uh, that I've heard for a while that's doing it and doing it really well. So, And there's a lot of bands now. There's a, the whole kind of undercurrent scene, super underground now, but fans doing that same stuff and doing it really well. So I'm kind of super excited about that because, you know, ultimately I'm, I'm a huge fan of that, always have been. So to see these kids who none of them were even born when the stuff that they're influenced by was coming out is pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, having been into metal for so long, I've gone through, you know, so many different phases. You know, in the early 80s, it was just, you know, it was metal. And then there was thrash and then death metal came along and black metal came along. And there's, you know, so many different subgenres now and i feel sort of privileged to have grown up through all that and been able to assimilate all these different styles whereas like some kids today they only like one style or another do you have a particular style that stands out to you or you know do you kind of like them all i do like everything i've always kind of even when i was growing up i liked everything i, I never had the oh if you like slayer you can't like queen's reich or if you like faith no more you can't like metallica well all that sort of stuff you know uh, so I, I've always liked everything, but I will say though that for my personal taste, if, if the music I listen to the most is 70s into early 80s metal, you know, Iron Maid's my favorite band of all time, so I love Maiden, Thin Lizzy, Rainbow, Sabbath, you know, all that sort of stuff is probably my my specific style that I love the most but I do like I mean I'll listen to everything I love death metal I love black metal I mean all that stuff I'll listen to all the time but definitely I, I, I would say the early that, that late 70s early 80s stuff, which is why a band like Visigoth is I'm really into because it's it's definitely right up my alley. Can I give you a podcast interview thumbs up for your header image of Rainbow Rising? Oh yeah that, thank you. Thank <laughs> that you. is awesome. Yeah, it's, that's my uh, second favorite album of all time. <laughs> I just got the promo the other day for the new job for a cowboy. Wow. Awesome, right? Yeah, that is pretty crazy. Those I've guys, only gotten about halfway through it so far, but I'm loving it. Cool. That guitar, the, that new guitar play they've got is so good. And that, just musically, those guys are at, at a really super high level. So uh, it's it's a fun, fun record. I, I love the way it came out. I think it's the best one they've done by far. Excellent. Can I ask you about Voivod? They're one of my favorite bands, and you, of course, released their first album, War and Pain. How did you come around to, you know, how did you discover these guys, and how did that happen? Just like anything else, somebody had sent me a tape. Uh, I knew somebody in Canada. <clears throat> I knew a few people in Canada, but somebody had sent me a tape of this, of this band from Quebec, and they didn't speak any English. So this guy was kind of, I guess, acting as their manager, more or less, and he sent me the demo, and I thought it was amazing. So we put them on a Metal Massacre first, and then right after that, we signed them to, to a record deal and put out that first record. But they didn't speak any English, and they parted, <laughs> they parted with the guy that, that, that I was basically dealing with. So once that happened, they went someplace else. So it was kind of, it was kind of a bummer, because we never were able to really get a hold of them because they didn't speak any English. So. <laughs> 
but a great band and that's uh i love it's still that record is still so good i mean all the voivod stuff is amazing but i still love that first record it still does really well we, we just reissued it with a whole bunch of cool stuff a few years ago too which came out really nice excellent if i could also ask you about a couple of bands that i i have heard before and that i really got into and then they just sort of disappeared one of those bands was beyond the embrace do you know whatever became of them they just broke up that was one of those things where they did a couple of records and they were they were kind of you know it's one of those situations where you get young bands and they they put out really great music and then they get out on the road and they realize this is kind of a tough life i'm not sure i want to do this <laughs> and i think that's kind of what happened to them a little bit is they a couple of the guys just didn't really like touring you know they were young guys they were faced with do i do i try to do this do i get a job do i go to work and they just kind of fell apart more or less but i heard that they're trying to come back come back around again so we'll see oh, well, that'd be good yeah i saw them on tour with uh iced earth and trivium and uh it was in the record theater in towson here and it was a very small stage and, and if i recall they had three guitar players and so they were all just kind of cramped and uncomfortable looking on stage <laughs> Yeah, it's too bad because that was a really good band. They had they had some definitely some momentum going, but just kind of fizzled out. Yeah, I love those guys. Um, another band I was curious about was Disillusion. Their album Back to Times of Splendor was amazing. I know that you know, their second album Gloria was a little bit different. Uh, maybe didn't come over quite as well with people, but uh, you know whatever happened to those guys? They were incredible. Um, yeah, this kind of the same thing. They just you know put out a couple of records and just kind of went their separate ways. The band just basically fell apart. One of the guys. One of the guitar players is in. Oh, I forget the name of the band. If you you could probably look it up online, but he's in he's in a new European metal band that's that's pretty good. Ah, uh, shoot, I can't remember the name of it now, but you can check that out. It's not. So it doesn't sound that much like Disillusion, but it's there. Okay, so my, one of my favorite bands of all time is the. Fate's Warning with John Arch. Do you think we're ever going to hear anything more from John Arch? I know he did the uh, the Arch uh, Matthäus album a couple years ago. Do you know, if, is there any plans for him, or is he just, is he done with music? No, no, no. He's not done with music. He's an interesting guy. He, I mean, one of my all-time favorite singers, and I love those first three Fate's Warning records, and that Arch Matthäus record is absolutely brilliant. I, I, st- I, I, that was the only thing I listened to for like three months, just over and over and over again. Yeah, he is um, one of my favorite singers of all time. Yeah, but he ha- he is has horrifically terrible stage fright, like unbelievable. He just he and he he knows that he can't explain it. He just he just can't do it. We actually got him to play two shows. Uh, on this, on for that album, which was somewhat amazing, and he was great at both shows. But he's kind of back, you know. He's got a, oh, he's got a kid, and he's got his life. He's got a nice store where he actually makes furniture and all this stuff. So he kind of likes what he does. And every couple of years, he'll he'll get out there and, and he'll do something. But it takes him. He's also a, a unbelievable perfectionist. Okay. So it it took him six months of rehearsing every single day to get his voice back into the shape that he felt it needed to be just to do the record and then the same thing for the tour. So it takes him a while. But I know Jim from Fate's Warning, who's the guitar player, uh, has been talking to him a little bit lately and I think that there's there's going to be some stuff happening. There's definitely going to be a, another Arch with Theos record. They're talking about some other interesting things too. So uh, I hopefully it'll happen. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. But I've I've always been a huge fan. He's been a great guy too. It's really it's too bad that he doesn't do more stuff. We we beg and plead him all the time. <laughs> please yeah. do more stuff, please. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question was whether you thought it would ever be possible to do you know, uh, they probably wouldn't do a, a Fate's Warning album together because, you know, they still have a singer for that. But uh if they could do some sort of like Awaken the Guardian, you know, tour, uh of course if he's got a stage fright issue then maybe that won't happen but that would be killer since i never got to see them yeah there definitely won't be a tour but you never know you never know what might happen all right well if i I can be more cryptic if i can be more cryptic and vague (laughs) (laughs) that's cool that hey that's better than nothing if you're cryptic and vague it means it means maybe i I can expect something (laughs) there you go there you go buke and i are both big vinyl fans and uh we've been you know for at least the last year been ravenously gathering up all the old vinyl that we could find and i've been having trouble finding some of the old metal blade vinyls and i was wondering if you have any plans to reissue any of the old albums on vinyl i know you do new albums on vinyl uh, but like particularly like uh celtic frost morbid tales you know can't find that anywhere or omens battle cry is there any any chance you might reissue the old stuff 
Yes. Well, what we're doing is um, we got the rights to a lot of the Roadrunner catalog. So we've been reissuing all that, like all the old Merciful Fade and King Diamond, um, Deicide, Sepultura, uh, Black Death Angel, tons and tons of stuff. If you go to our, our web shop, you'll see there's a lot of vinyl on there. Um, and like the stuff that you're talking about, the biggest problem that we have with doing more vinyl is that and this is not just our problem this is everybody's problem there are very few places that make vinyl anymore it's really everybody's really backed up and we're doing so much vinyl i mean everybody's doing so much vinyl that it just takes forever like if it was up to me we would do we would do much much more but it's just it just physically you just can't do enough of it but we did we did actually hire a new person well a new old person somebody that used to work for us that that ended up doing some other stuff that's coming back and helping us cuz we we need more manpower to do all this reissue stuff because, uh, like I said, we have all this stuff from Warner Brothers that we're doing, and then we also have the old Metal Blade stuff that we're doing. So, like you mentioned, Owen Battle Cry, it's been out on vinyl a couple times. We did, we have reissued it, uh, and we're going to probably do some more of it as well, maybe in Europe. But like, you, like you can go, you can get. We still have, we've done like Flotsam and Jetsam. We've done Awaken the Guardian by Fate's Warning. Uh, we've done, you know, we're trying to get back some of that old stuff as much as we can. But it's just a matter of, like I said, actually getting. Getting them vinyl made is is kind of tough. Now, at the start of your answer there, you mentioned King Diamond. Can you back me up and how awesome his tour is now? Amazing. Did you guys go to the show in Maryland? Yeah, we were at the Silver Spring show. I was there as well. Absolutely amazing, wasn't it? Oh, phenomenal. You know, Just, I've seen it. I've seen it in Europe on the big. You know, I've seen it in Europe quite a few times on the big festival stages, but seeing it you know crammed into these these uh theater venues is just it's just amazing and it's every show is sold out and it's kind of funny i was talking to a bunch of booking agents and it's kind of this tour is really up to every like all the other bands are looking at this tour and how well it's doing in the, in the production and they're all saying to themselves like we gotta have more production now <laughs> we gotta compete here so, yeah it's amazing brian that would lead me into my next question can you have you ever been to a walk-in or i'm assuming you've been to any other big metal festivals overseas right Absolutely, many times. You know, us here in the States, you know, when you're at the Silver Spring Show at the Fillmore, that or, you know, like OzFest or Mayhem is the biggest we have. That's not true. We've got the Maryland Death Fest. Well, yeah. But, how, Brian, how is a walk-in or one of those fests when you're getting 70, 80, 100,000 people at a concert? It's pretty intense. Uh, I recommend everybody that's a big metal fan that to go over and see one, at least one of the festivals, a Vakken or a Hellfest or Download or I mean, there's so you know every country's got several metal festivals. It's really amazing because you have a wide variety of types of music and these huge amounts of fans. We're all really into it. There's never any fights. Everybody gets along. It's super mellow. It's it's a very you know camaraderie sort of sort of vibe. It's it's awesome, and the bands all have a great time. So it's I love going over and seeing those things. It's so much fun, and everybody over there is really cool. So it's it's phenomenal, and it really you know they've been trying to do stuff like that here. I guess Mayhem is probably the closest thing, but there's not like a singular singular festival that that's like that. I guess you know Fun 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 or Coachella or these other ones are kind of like that, except they're not all metal. So yeah. is it just that the states are too big to try and pull off something like that? Well. I, I, that's part of it, you know, because we've, we've talked about it ad nauseum with the promoters over there because, you know, everybody over there wants to try to do it. Why doesn't it work in the States? Why doesn't it work in the States? And I think the first part of it is just geographically it's difficult. Like when you're doing a vodka and all those kids go there, like nobody drives. They're all taking trains and, and buses and this stuff. And you just don't have that sort of public transportation as much in the States or location where a lot of people can get to very easily. So Europe's a little more condensed when it comes to that. But I also think that the, that the American fans just weren't really used to that sort of festival. But now with Coachella, like I said, Coachella, Bonnaroo, uh, Fun Fun Fun, Lollapalooza, all these big singular festivals that do really, really well now, people are kind of into that notion of, going to a festival like that. So I think it's just a matter of time before somebody does it right in the right location out here and, and, it, and it works. We were just at the uh, barbecue for uh, the Dave Brocky Memorial and uh, we were talking with people there and we met these two guys from Arizona who drove on a Greyhound for 50 hours to get to the barbecue. Is wow. that dedication or what? That's amazing. That is really amazing. That's awesome. Wow. That's insane. Yeah, You know, the crazy thing about this fest, just like you mentioned it, is that you have a reunited emperor, uh, you know, finishing up one stage. And Avantasia will be closing the next stage. You know, worlds apart, but the fans are going crazy for it, loving it. Yeah, I mean that's the interesting thing. It's it's 
it's just this entity there where people love everything and and you know and if you and if you don't like a couple bands you just kind of go to the back and hang out so it works really well and and the fans over there they kind of tend to love a lot of different stuff too i mean maybe that's the reason why over here it's a little tough i mean metallica almost got it right with orion fest it, the i think if they would have made it more of a metal festival instead of kind of being all over the map it could have worked because they had everything else right but have you made it to a maryland death fest Oh yeah, I've been there a couple times. Absolutely. Yeah, but it keeps getting bigger and bigger every year. Yeah, it's good, man. I mean, they, you know, the cool thing about that festival is they bring over bands that you don't normally see here, and that's that's always a priority for them. Like, you know, they want to bring over bands that don't play America from Europe, which is awesome. Yeah, George is gonna die if he doesn't make it this year and see Trypticon. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It should be good this year. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna go because we have, I think, Primordials playing, and uh, we have a few bands playing. There's, it's a pretty good lineup so far that I've seen. Yeah, I got tickets for the Primordial Day too. Cool, awesome. So I'm a I'm one of those uh, metal and vinyl collectors who I, I'm a completionist. I have to have everything, and I used to be able to go to this list on the Metal Blade site that had a chronological listing of all the Metal Blade albums from you know the very first one up until the latest, and I used that as sort of a checklist. And I can't find that anymore. Did Did you guys get rid of that? No, it's still up there. Uh, I think it's under. It's not complete either because I, I was I actually was looking at it the other day. Uh, I think it's under, you know, let me, I'll look right now and I'll tell you, I believe it's under Thank you. history. Yeah. Cause, um, if you're going to go to the answer and go to the source, it can't go any higher than Brian here, right? <laughs> I was really disappointed. Yeah, no, it's still there. It's just, there's so much stuff on that site now. I think it gets a little, a little lost. Uh, I think if you go to, yeah, here we go. So you go to the metal blade site and you click on releases and then you click on year and you can select any year from all the way back to 1982. Excellent. And it doesn't show you everything. Uh, cause it's still, I guess they're still updating it, but it gives you a, a fairly good perspective what's going on. So, you know, speaking about years and stuff, as you click through that, are there, I see people tweeting at you all the time, vinyl and releases and stuff. Are there still times when people send you a tweet and you're like, Oh geez, I can't believe we released that. Or boy, that's an old gem from back in the day. It always makes you smile or something makes your, your day. Uh, it's always fun when people start talking about all older bands. And I mean, I remember all of it, so I still have all, all of it. And I mean, every band that we, that we basically comes through metal, Blade has to eventually get approved by me. So I'm pretty good at, especially the old stuff. But yeah, it's funny now how, for example, I'll give you a couple examples. Like one of my all time favorite bands of the, from the metal blade days was Sirith Ungle. It was always, Love them, and they were when they were actually in existence in LA. They were so out of the loop that nobody understood them, nobody liked them. They didn't, they couldn't really gain any traction or anything. And even you know, even in Europe and stuff, it just never, nothing ever really happened for them. But over the years, they've kind of grown into this like kind of cult. It's a massive cult thing now where you see Sarah Ungle shirts everywhere and people ask me about them. It's it's kind of funny how, you know, now 30 some odd years later, they're way more popular than when they first were out there. <laughs> And uh, a, a good friend of mine is this guy Chris Santos, who's um, he's on the that show Chopped on the Food Network. Yeah, and and he has, in my personal opinion, the two best restaurants in the world in New York City, Beauty and Essex, and Stanton Social. And he's a huge metal metal guy. I actually met him first as a metal guy, and then realized who he was later. But he tweeted, he texted me the other day, said, "Dude, I'm totally getting back into Anna Crucis and Sacrifice." Oh, oh yeah, like, oh, that's that, good stuff. awesome. Yeah, I was like, wow, cool, man. That's so cool. So I yeah, love it. I love it when people talk about that stuff. It's great. Sorry about that. When, like George mentioned, uh, not to try and bring the mood down here, but when George mentioned we were at that barbecue earlier in the year, I know you have a history with Dave Brocky over the years. You get you got anything you quickly want to say about him for your time with him? Well, I mean, one of my best friends, uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal human being. He uh, was incredibly smart, unbelievably funny. Uh, you know, he kind of had a it just it kind of had a bit of everything. He's a little manic, but you know most mm -hmm. artists are. But I, I, lo I loved working with Guar over all the years, and I always loved working with Dave and and talking to Dave. And he was just so unbelievably talented, not only as a front man for a rock band, but if you if you saw him in Holliston, the TV show that he was in, I mean, acting was naturally brilliant for him. He was amazing in that show. It's pretty or, hilarious. Know, yeah, he was on the Dan Patrick show a lot. He was on uh, that Fox uh, Red Eye channel a lot. And I mean, just the personality that he had and, and the character was was 
you could put him in any any situation and he would be just really amazing and and a really down to earth super nice great guy it's really so sad what what happened and at his uh, i unfortunately missed the the barbecue but i was at the the private memorial uh, right after he passed away and we were talking and uh, somebody said the one thing that that kind of cuz you know, you're like, how how could this have happened? I mean, he was a smart guy. You know, you wouldn't think he would do anything stupid. And we still, 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 nobody really knows exactly what happened. But somebody said uh, at the, at, we're just kind of talking about, you know, what had happened and how could could it happen. They said, you know, sometimes things that burn too bright. Uh, just com- spontaneously combust, and that's mm-hmm. like the perfect scenario for Dave. It's like he was mm-hmm. just so intense and so high energy that it just eventually he just he just exploded. <laughs> that's that's great. You have have you um, assuming you've met the other greats who've passed on? You've met Jeff from Slayer and you met Dio, right? Of course, absolutely. Dio is one of a kind, isn't he? Yeah, one of the nicest guys. Uh, there's people talk about like who are the nicest people in music and and D- Dio was always Ronnie Dio was always number one on the list along with Alice Cooper who's also one of the nicest guys in the world and Slash. Like we talk about like big time rock stars being super super nice people. Those three come to mind. And Ronnie was I mean obviously an unbelievably talented singer, but a really really good down to earth nice human being as well. Brian, last one for me. Is there anyone who in the music world or just in general that's still, because if I was to meet you, even talking to me right now, like I told you, I'm still honored. I'm truly honored to speak to you right now. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, is there anybody who you still meet who still, you're still awe inspired and awestruck to meet? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm not really too often with that sort of stuff, but I actually did mention that the podcast that I do, we actually had a, a non-athlete but a huge sports fan on, on the, the one that's coming up in November. We did it in New York last week, Frankie Bello from Anthrax. And the one guy that still freaks me out, there's probably two people that freak me out, and I've only met them very briefly. Uh, one of them is Tony Iommi, of course, from Black Sabbath, <laughs> uh, just because he's Tony Iommi. But more than anybody else is Steve Harris. Iron Maiden is my favorite band of all time i worship everything they've done i think he's the greatest songwriter of all time and I, it's funny because i'm really good friends with bruce and his son and his family I'm re- i've become really good friends with rod smallwood and i know the other maiden guys pretty well would you fly but, with bruce oh absolutely <laughs> okay absolutely i, I want to get on that I, I had the opportunity to be on that plane a couple times and i couldn't it didn't end up working i couldn't end up getting there okay. but i would love to but yeah steve harris still freaks me out I, frankie was telling us the story about hanging out with all the times he hung out with steve harris on the I hate you because he just – I've only met him. I interviewed him once for my fanzine in 1981 and he was super nice. And then I only met him uh, – a friend of mine forced him to take a picture with me like when he was like leaving an a after show at one of the main shows. So that's <laughs> the only two times I've talked to him. And, and I told these guys a story where I was at the – in Toronto when they were filming Flight 666. Yeah. They had like an after party because that was the final show of that run. Mm-hmm. So I was at the after party hanging out with all the, the people that I know there. And, and I saw Steve Harris talking to the guy from some. 41 and Steve Harris had that look of when you're talking to somebody and you want to get out of the conversation desperately you're not sure how to do it he had that look on his face I could tell I could see that look and I kind of looked at him and, and he kind of looked at me for a second and I was like I saw it and I was like oh man maybe I should go over there and say something so I was talking to some people and and I I walked, kind of walked around, and I saw him again doing it. And I was like, "Oh, maybe I should." But then again, you know, in the back of my head's like, "What if I, I'm wrong?" And I go up there, and the guy's like, "What is this asshole?" <laughs> so I walked right by him, and he like looked at me like, "Please help me!" And I just walked right past him. I couldn't. Do it. I'm just too intimidated to talk to him. <laughs> so he's definitely the one guy. <laughs> All right, I've got one more f- question for you as well. Given the state of the music business, what is Metal Blade doing to add value and, and stay viable in a digital music age where downloading is killing off so much of the music business? And for that matter, is it affecting you as much as, say, you know, the Beyonces and people like that? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we've been doing this longer than any other metal label by far, uh, and longer than a lot of labels. And, and I think the one thing that we've done over the years to, to stay alive live and stay successful is that we are never afraid of change and instead of being afraid of change I think we embrace the change and we're really trying to do that now with everything that's going on people ask me all the time about the whole you know illegal downloading all that sort of stuff and I mean certainly it's hurt and you know you you can't say that it that it hasn't affected sales and sales are a lot different now than, than they used to be but there's also an unprecedented access to music that people have that has never happened before and I think that that's I think there are more fans of music 
than ever before and certainly more fans of metal music than ever before and we're also very very lucky that the metal fans are unbelievably supportive of us and the artists so that's really kind of li helped limit a little bit the the, the sting I guess of, of the of the falling sales but you just have to do things a little bit differently you know you have to make sure that that you put out quality great records because if you don't there's no incentive for people to buy them and you have to every ask everything you can do like whether it's social media and we've been really big in social media I think that that's super important and you know we have we got into social media really early on more Twitter follows than any metal, metal lab or more more Facebook likes than metal, any other metal lab all that stuff uh, and we've embraced that and used that to our benefit and that's been a, a huge help for us as well and you just you know you try to put out better quality records you try to put out more bells and whistles with those records more special editions you know these direct to consumer things that we do on every record pre-orders we try to get a bundle of stuff that's really interesting that the fans like and all those so all of those things are really good and then there's other revenue streams out there that have been very helpful too that come into play uh like for example there's a, a company called sound exchange and what sound Exchange does is they collect all the royalties around the world for anything that's not like itunes or or related so it's satellite radio podcasts internet radio all this sort of stuff Stuff. And they collect all the money for that. And it's become a, a fairly significant amount of money now for both us and, and for the artists, which is really good. And then even the Spotify stuff, we, we were very late to the Spotify party, mostly because Spotify was giving the major labels all the money and the deals they were giving to the independents were not very good. And they finally aligned their deals with for the independents is the same as the majors. So we've been there. I don't know. I've, our whole catalog's been up there a little over a year. We found that it hasn't really hurt our sales, it's actually been what they want it to be, which is an, a separate revenue stream. So so in general, you know, we're using all these things as best we can to, to make things work. And it, it's working. I mean, the last four or five years have been four or five of the best years we've ever had. So excellent. Yeah, it's good. I mean, we had, you know, we had a we had a top 10 record with Whitechapel this year on the Billboard charts. I mean, if you would have told me that a band as heavy as Whitechapel would have a top 10 debut on Billboard. You'd kind of be like, what? So it's working. Excellent. So uh, Buke put out some questions on Twitter to some of our followers uh, to see if they had anything to ask you, and he's got a couple things to ask you now. All right, cool. And we're asking these, then we'll let you go. All right, sounds good. Uh, Adam Templeton asks, uh, was there ever a band signed to Metal Blade that you initially had low expectations for that turned out huge or vice versa? Uh, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. Um, there's probably been a few things that you would have thought. I mean, just – for example, a band like Armored Saint, we always thought was going to be a lot bigger than than they ended up being, unfortunately, for whatever reason. Uh, and you know, I could give you a list of fifty reasons, but I always thought they would be a lot bigger. And yeah, there are definitely there are definitely things that surprise you. I mean, certainly as are they dying when they first came out. You know, we knew that the band was really really good, and we liked them a lot, but we didn't know that they were ever going to be as huge as they are. And, and even a band like like Amada Marth, who started out, you know, their first three or four records were kind of you know good death metal band they had reasonable sales and then they just with fate of norns they just kind of took a little bit of a musical turn and that really kind of exploded it so you know it's always nice to see that sort of stuff you always have good expectations but it's nice to see when things really kind of get big and even i mean look if you would have told me cannibal corpse would be as big as they are now when we first signed them in 1990 i wouldn't have believed you either so sorry they were just at like 32 on billboard yeah 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 but they're you know they've sold well over two million records in their career now which is crazy that's ridiculous that's awesome and our second and last question here from dano is and this is going to make it this this is going to put you up on a high point buddy other than himself who would be on the mount rushmore of metal non-musician who gave metal bands their opportunities Oh, well, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I put myself up there, but <laughs> uh, well, you know, there's, there's a lot of people. I mean, I, I'll, uh, I guess I have to limit it to three others. Is that there's four people on Mount Rushmore, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's definitely uh, a, a guy in Germany named Gotts Kundemand. We started a magazine over there called Rock Hard that became the largest uh, mag hard rock and heavy metal magazine in Germany and had massive, massive influence over what people in Germany bought and then in essence, you know, what people around the rest of the world bought. Then uh, a guy in Japan named Masa Ito, who is the king of heavy metal in Japan. He's launched a career of every single major metal band in Japan and had, again, had a massive, massive influence on what people, till, to this day, what people buy in Japan. He's got radio shows and he writes for Burn Magazine and a bunch of magazines in, in Japan. So those two two guys for, for sure. Um, wow, there's so many others. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to get somebody in, in the U.S. 
that uh, that I would give credit to. You know, I'll give credit. I'll give credit to somebody that kind of doesn't get enough credit as he should. But I'm gonna I'm gonna shout out to Jose Mangan of <laughs> Sirius XM. He's a funny dude, but I'll tell you that guy that guy really, even though he's got a crazy personality on the radio, that guy knows his metal big time, uh, and he's been so supportive of of really everybody. And, and satellite radio is a huge huge influence here in the in the U.S. on on what people are buying because there is no radio really anymore. No. And, so many people subscribe to that and listen to that channel. You see, if if he puts something into heavy rotation, like a, for example, a band like Battlecross, it's on our label. He, he I mean, made them. He, totally, he made them. I mean, he put them on and really pushed them, and that pushed them to to make to be a pretty popular band. So he's got a lot of he's got a lot of power over there, and I think he he his sta- his taste in music is is pretty is pretty good too. So uh, so I'll give him some credit there as well. And I guess the last one we should probably. Uh, put up there is uh, well, there'll be there'll be two little faces up there. But Kevin Lyman, who runs <laughs> Fear, the 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 Warp Tour and Mayhem, and then John Reese, his partner, who really is the one that runs Mayhem. I mean, Mayhem has always been a, a huge a huge force in in helping stuff out as well. So so there's that's some- awesome. Well, Brian, from my end, it is. I just want to say it's truly an honor, and from the bottom of my heart, a true honor to speak to you. Uh, as the hockey season goes on, I'd love to get you back on and talk to you again. Just not even about metal, just talk about hockey. Yeah, so man, if, any time. But I absolutely have to get to a Caps game this year. So, like if uh, if you go to a Caps game, it would be my pleasure to maybe meet you beforehand or after or at the game. Absolutely, we'll we'll sort it out later, brother. All right, man. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Hope oh, maybe we'll see you in the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Yes. Take it easy. Take care. Bye bye. All right. So that was our interview with Brian Slagle, our first interview here on the Metalheads podcast. Now that I've got that figured out how to record all that, hopefully we'll start doing some interviews with each of the bands that we feature each week. Did you ever think you'd be talking to him? That was certainly not going to be my guess that it would be the first one. It was when, no, Tuesday, Tuesday night, which is two days ago, when I texted Buke and said, hey, I think I got this thing figured out. Let's do like a test interview, you know, something small, something low pressure and, you know, and, and try and get it on and do a test. And he's like, well, I've got an interview with Brian Slagle on Thursday. <laughs> and I'm like, hold on, I'm going to change my pants. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I think we can pull that off. I, I'm fairly confident I've got the tech working to the point where this will work out. And we did an, actually have a few technical difficulties on our end, but uh, I believe that you know that didn't uh, affect the recording at all. So thank the gods yeah. for that. Yeah, you know, we didn't mention it in the podcast because I didn't because I'm sure he's asked or talked about. We Every did. time he's on an in- interview. You mean you didn't mention it in yes. the interview? Yes, and I did not mention it in the interview. But for those of you who do not know, he started Metal Blade. He has launched a career of many, many bands. Put out Metal Massacre in a day which debuted Me- Metallica for the first time. Mm-hmm. So many bands got their yeah. start there on Metal Blade. It's it's mind-boggling. And to, to do our first podcast interview with him, it's like... <laughs> what kingdoms are left to conquer? <laughs> you know? Extremely. I, mean, I will say it again, like I will say it every time. Extremely, extremely nice man to talk to. Yeah, he was he, he, down was, he was fun. And I've always thought, you know, you, you look at the picture of him and you go, he looks like a cool guy. He looks I like, like you. Yeah, I was thinking that too. He looks kind of <laughs> like me. So, Brian, if you're listening this far into the podcast Thank still, you. and you are in town for a Caps game, we'd love to hang out with you, you know. Watch the game, have some beers. I don't know if you drink, but if you do, have a beer and, uh, you know, let us show you our town. (laughs) All right. Thanks again. All right. Well, let's get into some news. I'm so terribly excited to be able to tell you that there's a new Nightingale album called Retribution, which is going to be released on January 27th. Like I said, January is when things start to pick up again. Nightingale, of course, is one of the side project bands for Don Svanu. Who? Exactly. (laughs) I'm sorry. The the man behind Edge of Sanity. He's been in Bloodbath. He's done vocals and produced on so many albums. You haven't even mentioned it. If you don't mention our favorite album. Witherscape. Sorry. Thank you. Like I said, so many things that he's been on. Yeah. If you have not listened to Witherscape, please, please, please give it a listen. Yeah, but Nightingale is another one of his bands. Don is one of those guys who he can do incredible harsh vocals like he did with Bloodbath, and he can do beautiful clean vocals like he does with both Witherscape and Nightingale. Nightingale is the project he did to satisfy some of his more commercial needs. 
not needs and like he needed money, but like he wanted to do some things that weren't quite so heavy, kind of like, you know, Michael's doing with Opeth now, but he, rather than changing what he was doing, he just had a band on the side. He's like, this is where I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's like proggy metal kind of stuff. And it's amazing. I'm not a big prog metal fan, but I love everything this guy does. And I've been chomping at the bit for a new Nightingale album in January. We get one, so I cannot wait for that. You know, I'm excited. Dude. This once you turn me on to Witherscape, which totally blindsided me. Mm-hmm. I I've been all about him again. Yeah, so definitely excited about this. Have you been watching the Metal Grasshopper video series featuring Phil Anselmo and comedian Dave Hill? Of course. Hey, did you see the second one? I did not see the second. one. I just I'm sorry. watched the second one uh, yesterday, and <laughs> this is some pretty funny shit. You would uh, you? I think you might be surprised to find how. Phil Anselmo is actually quite funny in a very deadpan sort of way. Really? Yeah. I mean, he's just like, hey, you know, I'm Phil Anselmo and fucking dick, you know. And it's just, it's just funny. And I don't know how many episodes are going to be in this series, but I can't wait to see them all because they're, they're freaking hilarious. So apparently, Ingve Malmsteen wants to jump on the Gene Simmons <laughs> bandwagon by saying that new bands have no chance of becoming rock stars. Way to coattail for the exposure, Ingve. <laughs> Yes, but is he saying anything that wrong? No, he's, it's not that he, he isn't, because it's true. Rock stars are, dead. for, for the most part, dead. You know, you see Ingve, he's got a, a driveway full of Ferraris. Why you need more than one Ferrari? I don't know. He, I saw a picture. It looked like he had like a bunch of the same Ferrari. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand that. But I guess if you have more money than you know what to do Where with. Where is his money coming from now, though? Leftover 80s money. I don't know, but... <laughs> You know, it's not you know, it's not so much that he's saying it. I mean, what he's saying is essentially true, but who cares? It, it just I don't. It just seemed like an opportunist kind of thing yeah. to say to me. That, that like, Gene Simmons story made headlines everywhere, right? And everybody's got a kick in their two cents and whatever. You know, no offense, Ingve, but come on, just go back to playing your guitar. And That's quiet. what you do well. Yes, do that. <laughs> So I heard that uh, Ozzy's hoping that Bill Ward will get himself together and appear on the final Black Sabbath album next year. I I agree. I really hope that we can get Bill on this album. Like, I guess it goes without saying. I mean, 13 was amazing, and it didn't feature Bill, but for closure, for, it would be really nice if Bill could be on the album. You so. took the words out of my mouth, yes. For, to, to go out, there's no other way to do it. Yeah. I hope the animosity isn't too strong. Yeah. That they can go out. Together. Yeah, you know, there's rumors. They're like, oh, it was a contractual thing. Bill wanted more money. And then, like, the band is saying he just couldn't physically do it. And I, I don't know. I, whatever it is, I don't care what it is. Just please work it out. Mm-hmm. We, wa- we want you back, Bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. We definitely. I, and if it's anything like 13, I, I'm eagerly awaiting it. It'll be sad to, to see him go. Yeah. Well, Geezer was saying they had, like, four or five tracks left over from 13. Which, on in one sense, is like, cool, all right, well, it's a jump start. But on the other hand, those songs weren't good enough to make the album. And whenever people base the follow-up album, like, say, Reload, on albums that didn't make the cut for the first album, it worries me a little. So, I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, I just want to say to the people who didn't like 13, is that what were you expecting from Black Sabbath at at this point? Good point. You know, after... 30. 70s, 80s, 90s. After three, four, after four decades of putting out, you know, yeah, what four five, or five decades? Five decades. Yeah. <laughs> Which what are you expecting of them? Yeah. And what what could have been better with than what they gave us? <laughs> yeah, and it, that's what I don't understand. Is that I heard some criticism for, about this album and about Sabbath that they're not doing anything new or it's boring. It's the same old stuff. Well, it's this is Sabbath. <laughs> it's the original. How can you go wrong? Yeah, but and the thing is, this is not. Never Say Die Sabbath, where you could see that they were just phoning it in. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they were expecting, but... Well, I, for one, was very happy with it. Ah, You and I were both. All right, so this next news item I included, even though it's not technically metal news. In fact, there is no any way about it that it's metal, but we'd been talking about the subject so much lately, and in fact, you and I were talking about this earlier. Yeah, directly impacts me, yep. That I wanted to mention it because it just... It broke my heart to see this news article. Country singer Glenn Campbell, I don't really know much of his music. I've heard the song like Rhinestone Cowboy, but you know, you know who he is. He's got Alzheimer's and you know, you know where that leads. 
and he recorded a song called I'm Not Going to Miss You. And listening to that song, it just broke my fucking heart. Is the late Johnny Cash doing a cover of Nine Inch Nails Hurt? What's that got to do with it? In the sense that you hear an old man almost at the end of his life. Well, yes. In the sense that, you know, yes, but you, this you, you hear the lyrics kind of going sure, but, you deep. But, but the, the reason that I mention this is because these lyrics specifically address the fact of his disease. He's saying, you know, the song's called, I'm not going to miss you. And he's not going to miss his, it's about his wife. I'm not going to miss you because I don't remember you. And the lyrics are just so, you know, I've heard a lot of deep, powerful lyrics and metal songs before, but this just, oh, it just crushed me. The fact that, you know, he's like, this is going to happen and, you know, and it's going to be terrible for you, but it's not going to be bad for me because I'm not going to miss you because I'm not going to know any different. I won't remember you. It's just like we were talking about before this. And, you know, obviously listeners to the show don't know, but after this podcast ends, I'm loading my wife and newborn child into the car and we are traveling to out of state to have my daughter visit my grandmother for the first time who has dementia now after a stroke and my 83 year old grandmother for her whole life always wanted a a daughter always 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 and she never had one and my baby girl is the first girl in the family and when she meets her for the first time this weekend who knows how well she'll even realize that she's seeing her granddaughter yeah. Or in the, hey, she may meet her this weekend. Her disease may get bad and by Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, she might totally forget that fact. Yikes. Yeah. It's and the sad thing is there's nothing you can do to stop it. Yeah. Well give your grandmother a hug for me. And- yeah, I will. You know, grandma always loved you. You know, just yeah. to get a little insight here on the podcast. Grandma always loved you. And I love her too. <laughs> She's a really cool lady. Yeah. I, I, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I don't care. You guys call me a pussy or a pansy or whatever. I, my grandmother lived with me for a number of years, and I took took care of her. So uh, grandma's special to me. So if anybody has anybody battling Alzheimer's or de- dementia and stuff, it's a tragic disease that your body is fine around you, but your mind mentally is falling apart. Like when you, when you lose the ability to, you know, grandma at 83, when your mind doesn't understand the concept of chewing and swallowing, you know, something that seems, how could you forget that? <laughs> it's just mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. It's tragic. Very. So, yes, we know this new story isn't metal, but we had to bring it up because, you know, maybe take a second and listen to this because it's it's pretty powerful. Yeah. And it affects a lot of families out there. You know, I'm talking about moms, dads, you know, husbands and wives who don't know their children, don't know their spouse. After spending decades with them, you know, oh, listeners out there may be going through this now. So just take a second to listen to the song. Yeah. All right. Now to get out of the somber mood again. Let's, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's take this up a level with something somewhat amusing. At least I thought it was kind of amusing. K.K. Downing, the uh, <laughs> former guitar player from Judas Priest. I was reading this article. Uh, it, it was about one thing, about how he left the band and they're carrying on with uh, Richie, what's it, Faulkner, I think mm-hmm. his name is. And, you know, they were talking to him about, well, you know, how do you feel about them carrying on? And he's like, oh, yeah, great, you know, whatever. Yeah, he goes, that doesn't, yeah, he goes, he felt his time had run its course. Sure, them. yeah. And, but the thing that I took out of the whole article was the fact that K.K. Downing is going to be releasing his own Metal for Men fragrance. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what? A cologne for men. I don't know that if metal for men was the actual name, but wow. Okay. Call me silly, mm-hmm. but I might actually get that <laughs> <laughs> just because I'm like, it's metal. Maybe I should try it. Well, you know? just because you wear like suave for men now. I don't know. wear anything now. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've got something that you know, I dab on for occasion that my wife likes for, you know, the special occasions, <laughs> but, uh, but hey. It's metal for men. It sounds kind of cool. You're speaking about Priest Day. I went to the record store. I bought Rockarola. Rockarola. On vinyl today. Yeah. Anything I make off that album? No. Yeah. That's. <laughs> no. I flipped it over and I'm like. That's the first album. I yeah, think. it is. And I flipped it over and I'm like, I no. don't know anything off this. No. Album Sad at Wings all. of Destiny is where things really take off. Yeah. I didn't know anything off this album, but I don't have it. So. Now you do. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I had to buy it. Well, it seems nary a week goes by where we don't have an article about Michael Ackerfelt from <laughs> Opeth, which, given the fact that they just released an album, is you know makes sense. But and because this is our podcast and I love them, yes. So uh, he was saying that uh, it may have been a mistake to play so many new songs on the Heritage tour. Okay, well. My question here is, does this mean that the upcoming tours will feature more older songs? Does this mean that there will be, at least, if not on in albums, at least on tour, there will be harsh vocals? Hmm. Yeah. I listened to this interview. Well, I read it. Um, I don't understand what he was trying to say with this. When he said it featured too many. I think maybe, you know. Was the problem is that he said that when they put the set list together, they were drinking and they probably had too much, too many to drink. Yeah, he said something like they had like a 40 song set list yeah. and you can never play that. And though obviously they had to narrow that down. And, uh, you know, if any band has a new album out, you can't go out on tour and like play the whole album. Yeah. People, unless of course it's your first album. But if you're somebody that has a catalog like Opeth does, people are going to a show. They want to hear their favorite songs as well. And so what I thought he was saying was that, well, there were too many new songs and not enough older songs on the previous tour. And, okay, does that mean that they will remedy that and play more older songs on this next tour? And if they play older songs, will they be harsh vocal songs? I don't know. I mean, either way, whatever. But it was just sort of a, hmm, I wonder. You know me, you know Opeth. I don't know what to take from this because I've seen Opeth on tour 14 times. And each time I see him, it's a different freaking tour. You know, it's a damnation tour when they're playing all acoustic stuff. That's good, though. It's the Heritage Tour, and they're playing all acoustic stuff. If you were getting the same thing every time, that'd be boring. Nah, not for me, though. Yeah. The funny thing is, George the other day was adding me on Skype. He says, hey, what's your information on Skype? And I gave him my email address, and it was Opeth fan something something it's at Hotmail. And he goes, oh, <laughs> Opeth something. Surprising. Yes. I, sh I should have known. <laughs> I should have known it was Opeth something. So me and Opeth have a special connection that I don't know what to think of them now, but we'll see what the future brings. But you know, I'm going to ask you this, though. If you're a band like Opeth or you're a Slayer, you're Me Metallica, aside from the hits, you can't play a deep track. Why not? Because that's not what the fans are there buying tickets for. How well, many fans are there buying tickets to hear Trapped Under Ice? Well... You're assuming that people have... How many fans are buying tickets to hear Expendable Youth? The thing is, most metal fans are into albums, not songs. And so they hear a song like that, they're going to be, oh, sweet, they put Expendable Youth. You know, Slayer, how many hit songs does Slayer have? Slayer doesn't have hit songs. <laughs> I mean, don't. the Angel of Death is their most well-known song, perhaps, but they don't I have Raining Blood hits. More. You know? Raining Blood more. Are you kidding me? Really? I... Pff. Back in the day, I was all about Angel of Death, Raining Blood, whatever. I mean, it's a good song, but <laughs> Angel of Death, come on, yo. That's a discussion for another podcast. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, there are certainly songs that people want to hear, but there's, most metal bands have plenty of room in their set to throw in a, at least a couple of deep tracks. Have you ever gone to a concert and been disappointed always. that they didn't play something? Always. Okay. Any standout? No, like, okay, it, every, it, would be like, it would be like going to a Maiden show and them not playing Run to the Hills. Yeah. Yeah, you know it, they're going to play it every, every, time. every show. There's always a song you want to hear. Except that Iron Maiden. Like, Iron Diamond didn't play Abigail. Yeah. I was going to say Iron Maiden does a pretty good job of playing what I want to hear, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, there's always something, you know. It's just, it's the nature of the beast, you know. If you have a, a lot of good songs, you can't get them all in. you got to try and rotate them in once in a while, change things up. But what can you do? You can't do anything about it. And I don't know what you think of this next story here. Yeah, the Skeleton Witch singer Chance uh, dropped off the tour uh, for personal reasons. He said it was emergency personal reasons that he had to leave. Yeah. So the band is continuing on as a four-piece instrumental band right now. But you, I would have thought somebody would have picked up the vocals. Nope. Really? It's just it's, instrumental? Yep. Huh. I would be really surprised that fans accept that. Yeah. And apparently I looked on Twitter for like Skeleton Witch and they're loving it. I mean, I suppose instrumental Skeleton Witch is better than no Skeleton Witch, but I would have thought like, you know, a guitar player or bass player or something nope. would have like picked up the vocals. And no one jumped up there and taken it. Yep. That is very interesting. So, and um, I was on Twitter and I thought, you know, because when you read a story like this, you think family problems or something. And someone said, no, his brother or someone's in the band with him. Mm -hmm. So you think it's not family problems, because if it was, his brother would probably leave. 
Or it could be health. It could, it be, could be health. It could, it could, could be. It could be you financial. Know, it financial could be some problems. Legal. Yeah. You so know, who knows? But. We hope if it's illness or whatever, we hope you're doing well. And can't um, wait to have you back. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and us being hockey fans, this next news story here, the Minnesota Wild are using the Hammerfall song, Fury of the Wild, as their home intro song. Yeah, as if, if you just listened to the interview we did with Brian Slagle, of course, we mentioned that there as well. Yep, and did you see this news story too, guys? Minus the uh, Exodus, Blood In, Blood Out, made number 38 on the Billboard charts. Metal is just charting left and right. I saw it, it was on Twitter again. Was this the highest charting Exodus oh, ever I'm, for them? I'm sure it was, yeah. Yeah. They're not the only ones that charted, or, well, are about to chart anyway. Yeah, I've taken these last couple of news stories because I wanted to mention this one because this one hurts, and I never wanted to see somebody take this. Slipknot are projected to hit number one on the Billboard charts with between 100 and 110,000 copies sold. That is just wow. In one week, I mean, you're talking about like how Lamb of God did 250,000 in the year for... for you know, uh, and, and they're doing like over 100 in one week. Holy crap. This angers me. This well, angers me because I'm a Pantera fan through and through. They got me into metal. Mm-hmm. Pantera previously held the heaviest band to debut number one on the, not, not debut, but for their album to come out number one on the charts. So you think Slipknot is heavier than Pantera? That's what you're admitting here. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not. But you know this day and age that we live in, people would say, oh, this album and Far Beyond Driven, mm-hmm. they say Slipknot's heavier than Far Beyond Driven. Well, technically, it probably is. Doesn't mean it's better than Far Beyond Driven. I'll, I'll give you that. I guess right now. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I guess my Slipknot Five vinyl showed up the other day. I it's a pretty nice vinyl. I saw the pictures of it. I haven't I haven't spun it yet, but like I said, I've been listening to the promo for it, and it's really good. It's, I mean, obviously, it's not going to be. It's not going to make my end of the year list, but doesn't mean I can't enjoy it because it doesn't start with a T and end with an N. <laughs> it doesn't start with T and end on Ripticon. <laughs> but, but no, I mean so, it, it was it was a fun lesson regardless. So let's get into some new releases of the week, huh? All right. This first band is one that I haven't really heard much about in a long time. I've never heard of them. They're called INC Indestructible Noise Command. They put out two albums in the eighties, and I remember them from the eighties. Okay. And then they broke up or whatever for a very, very long time. And they put out an album in 2011, which was meh. It was all right. But then they're getting ready to release a new album called Black Hearse Serenade. And I got a copy of this, and I've been listening to it, and I'm like, hell yeah. Hmm. This is a really good thrash album. So if you're looking for some good thrash, and you've already got the new Exodus, check out Indestructible Noise Command and Black Hearse Serenade. Good stuff. Next up, of course, I won't go into too much. Obviously, the new Slipknot just came out. Lots of people have already apparently bought it. Check it out. The next one is one that I've been waiting for. A really cool band. These guys, when you took, when your last album came out and you said, Puke, check them out, these guys have really been hooking me. Yeah. This is Abysmal Dawn. They're an L.A. band. This is their fourth album called Obsolescence. I first heard about these guys when their last album came out, Leveling the Plane of Existence. Mm -hmm. This is some heavy-ass death metal, technical good stuff. If you like it heavy and death, fucking check these guys out. Then, of course, there's the new Anal Nathrock. DC De Ratum. DC De Ratum, I believe, is the name of the new Anal Nathrock album. Why do they have to make everything so complicated? I really loved their last album. Vanitas? I think mm-hmm. that's how it's like a, like, it sounds like a, something you'd order at Taco Bell. But, uh, yeah, I can't pronounce anything these guys do, but their last album was fucking killer. The new album, I have to admit, I've been listening yeah. to it and it hasn't grabbed me as much as the last one yet. I, but I haven't even gotten all the way through the album yeah, I was yet. I to ask you, when you heard the promo, mm-hmm. you were excited. Right. Remember, you sent me a text and you're like, Buke, this is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. When they, pl- uh, they put out a you know a single YouTube video, whatever. I was like, all right. Because all right. Godless says they're one of the best bands in metal now. They certainly have that potential. I will agree with that. I could just be being you know bitchy. Mm-hmm. You know, I maybe I was in a bad mood when I was listening to it. Oh, you in a bad mood? What me? Never. <laughs> 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 certainly not after a King Diamond concert. <laughs> 
but maybe I wasn't paying close enough attention. I don't know. It just, you know, when I was listening to it, and I've only listened to it once and not, didn't even get all the way through, it just sort of sounded all the same to me. I was like, hmm, I don't know. Nothing special. Nothing, yeah. not as special as the last album, but, you know, I am definitely going to revisit it, and, you know, hopefully I'll be able to recant that at some later date and be like, no, nah, it's fucking awesome. Now, this one, could this challenge your number one? No. Wow, because hearing what I've heard so far, this is strong. This is uh, at the gates with at war with reality. I've heard the whole album. I have. I got. Okay. The pr- I got the promo. Okay, it is good. It is very good. Is it a slaughter of the soul follow up? It's it's along the same lines. Obviously, slaughter of the soul came out in 1995, so there's nearly 20 years of experience mm-hmm. and and whatnot. It doesn't sound ex- like you know a direct sequel or anything. But it is in the same vein, and for that reason, it is of course really good. Well, the fact it's good because it's good. But what I mean is, it's what you would expect. It didn't. They didn't like you know veer off into some strange, crazy direction where you're like, "Whoa, this is at the gates." What? Yeah. So in that sense, it is a really good album for me personally. Is that where I am right now? Nah, not really. You've been there, place in a couple years. No, no, I, you know, I'm, my, my head is in a completely different place right now, but I can easily give them the props and respect that they have earned and deserve for this album because it is a very good album and it will make my list at some number. I just don't know where yet. And it was announced this past week that they're going on tour with Converge. I um, hate Converge. Yeah, so do I. They're like a minute, two minutes of noise and screaming give me a week they'll probably be my favorite band i whenever i say i hate somebody (laughs) i i I always eat those words so you take a microphone take a guitar take some drums throw it down the fucking flight of stairs eh, that's converge it's just i don't know i don't get it but you know people like it so people like dillinger escape plan too i I know a couple of podcasters in particular and i i don't get that shit (laughs) next on the list is astral doors notes from the shadows this is their seventh album, and these guys are a Swedish uh, kind of power metal band, kind of just a heavy metal band. Um, you know, like obviously they've been around for a little while. I've never been a huge like oh Astro Doors, but sometimes the singer reminds me kind of of Dio, and so I'm like oh, and so I, I always check them out, and I listen to a couple tracks off this album so far, and you know it's good, so definitely check these guys out. Uh, Dio in the sense like epic. Yeah, I mean, like he, I mean, he literally. Uh, the last album is called Jerusalem. Okay, and I didn't really notice it so much on the songs I listened to on this album, but on that last album, I was like Jerusalem. I was spinning that. I was like, dude has got a very Dio sound to his voice. I was hmm. just like, wow. So that's what keeps me coming back. One of the prodigies from Canada, Devin Townsend, is releasing Z Two. You and I saw him live a couple years ago. A yeah. blast seeing him live. Yeah, I made a little bit of fun of him on Twitter the other day with Godless about uh, how he used to sing on that Steve Vai album with his weird haircut and all. And I was like, wow, that was really bad. I mean, it wasn't bad. It was actually pretty good. But it's kind of like, you know, I wouldn't own up to it now. But the fact remains, Devin Townsend, one of the most amazing people in metal now and of the past 20 years, strapping young lad and like everything he's done solo. The man is just... I could never even begin to fathom what goes on in his mind. He is a truly fascinating individual. You being strapping young, young lad fan. Yes. And no, I, I bought city on CD when it first came Mm -hmm. out and I was like, Ooh, wow, that's different. You know, very heavy. And I just got it on vinyl recently. Hell yeah. Um, so, you know, a mediocre fan, you know, I always pay attention to whenever he releases anything. I remember when we saw them live, I'm sitting there and my exposure to him was minor. And I'm sitting there like, he was like the weird owl of metal. <laughs> the whole shaved head thing kind of creeps me out. Yeah, and this is stage presence. He was, the facial gestures he's making. He's, he's a genius. genius. And honestly, I, I, you, you, you know, it's just, I, I firmly believe that we just don't understand what he's up to. Possibly. Now, the next one here, ob- obituary, inked in blood. Hell Yeah. As I've been saying in the last few episodes, I'm a new convert to Obituary, even though I've been a metal fan for years and years, and they've been around for years and years. I just never got into them until recently, and you know, I've been going back through the catalog and loving it up, and of course, I've been listening to the new album, and it is also quite good. 
you might need to do a convincing buke on these guys <laughs> <laughs> because the singer has always sound whiny. I used to think the same thing. And then I don't, for reasons unknown to me, I went back and listened to it and I was like, wow, he sounds <laughs> unique. It doesn't sound, I mean, with all the harsh types of vocals that I listen to, it's like, uh, it's actually much clearer than quite a few of them that I listen to. So, you know, somehow I've acclimated to it and gone, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> so what's our in indie band for the week? Wow, we're finally getting to that. All right. <laughs> this week's indie band comes from our own backyard. This is the band Aries from their new album, Rise. Now, this is an interesting story. Uh I don't know if you've possibly read the article on the Metal Disciple website, or maybe I even mentioned it on a podcast, but this band first came to my attention when I went to a play, a, a musical, of Sweeney Todd that was done prog metal in okay. Washington, D.C. by the uh, the Landless Theater Company. I went because Nina from A Sound of Thunder was playing. I remember them. my response to you was, WTF. Hey, what's wrong with theater, man? Especially when it's done uh, metal. I, I'm not ashamed to admit I love Les Mis in uh, theater. All right, then. <laughs> quit quit stomping on my balls. <laughs> so anyway, my wife and I went to go see this production of Sweeney Todd, prog metal Sweeney Todd. And I was like, Nina, Nina. And I was, I was, I was, mm -hmm. I was digging on Nina, and she did a great job, and as did everyone in the show. But there was this one guy, and his name's Rob Bradley, and he played the character of Pirelli. And he walks out on stage, his clothes and his, you know, his, his costume. He's got his cape on. He's, and he's supposed to be this flamboyant, uh, barber character called Pirelli. And he just busts out this like, whoa, you know, I couldn't even come close to that. And I was like, whoa, what is that? <laughs> you know, and it just stopped me dead and just blew my mind. I was like, okay, I want to hear more of this guy. And I'm like fumbling through the uh, the program for the show, going, "Who's who's a Pirelli?" I'm like, "Rob Bradley plays in a band called Aries." I'm like, "Okay, all right, I'm gonna have to look that up." And when I did my write up for the show, Rob, you know, contacted me and was like, "Hey, you know, I, I don't actually remember the, the conversation <laughs> specifically. I just know that he got a hold of me because he thought it was a good write up, and he asked me if I wanted to hear uh, Aries." new forthcoming album rise and i was like sure you know i'd love to hear it so he sent me a copy of it and unfortunately with all the turmoil that's been going on in my life recently in terms of my job i have not been doing much reviewing on the website lately and so the album came out and i hadn't gotten to the review yet they played a show in frederick at the cafe 611 last weekend i was out of town i was like Ugh, you know I don't want Rob to think that this has anything to do with what I think of his music, because in fact, I really liked their music. And so I was able to finally publish a review this week. And Aries music is not typical of what you're going to hear on this podcast. On this podcast, I tend to play some really heavy stuff. Aries is more of a hard rock metal, like late 70s, early 80s kind of retro thing, but yet not retro. It has a very contemporary sound playing in an older style. My like off the top of my head, first impression of these guys was old Judas Priest meets Operation Mind Crime era Queensryche. Hmm. You know the, the the music is really good. They do harder songs. They do ballads. Rob's voice is amazing, and I'm going to play you some songs from them tonight. I was so impressed, and I, I normally we play two songs, but to give you a range of of what this album Wait, sounds like. I asked Rob if I could play three songs tonight. So we're going to play two songs in a row for you now. The first song is called The Road One Way. Check that out.
So that was Aries and The Road, One Way. We're going to play you another song from them now. This is more along the ballad lines, but it's still an incredible song. It takes me back to the old days in the 80s when I used to go to shows and, you know, bands actually played a mix of the type of things. You know, nowadays it's all, you have to be as heavy as possible all the time. And so much cool stuff from that period has gotten lost. And this is something that Aries is actually reviving and I hope more bands will do the same. So now, check out the song, When the World Needs a Hero. Face your 
All right, that was Ares and When the World Needs a Hero. Pretty awesome stuff, yeah? Yeah, that was, that was pretty sweet stuff. I mean, I had been totally oblivious to them before. Excellent. Pretty good stuff. Excellent. So with Slagle on the podcast, I thought, hey, let's do a uh, Metal Blade artist this week for our top three list. Sounds good. And what do you I got? decided Amon Amoth. Amon Amarth. Yeah, so uh, I thought, hey, let's do them for our top three list of the week, and here we are. Let's do it. I think this week we may be similar. I doubt it. Really? Okay. My number three. Three is actually the album that got me into Amon Amarth with Versus the World. Okay. The song Death and Fire, I heard it on Sirius XM Radio, hooked me back in the day. Uh, Number two is a pretty recent release, is Twilight of the Thunder God. Mm -hmm. And number one, because start to finish every song fucking rocks is with Odin on our side. <laughs> we do not have a single overlapping album. Are you serious? I'm serious. No, we're not. I'm serious. Dude, with Odin on, on our side, let me just tell you fucking for a second here. Fucking for a second. No, no. Stop. That's what your wife said. <laughs> no. Dude, with, with, with Odin on our side, Valhalla awaits runes to my memory. Uh... Gods to war with Odin on her side, cry of the blackbirds. There's no there's no convincing me. Okay. I, I like all no. the Amana Marth. I just happen to choose these albums for particular reasons. Can I say their most recent release, Deceiver of the Gods, was kind of disappointing. No, you can't say that because that's one of mine. Okay. <laughs> I'm, like I said, go ahead, George. <laughs> go ahead. All right. My num- I love this segment. Go ahead. My number three is their first album, Once Sent from the Golden Hall. Okay. This was the first time I heard the band. I received the promo from Metal Blade back in, God, what what year was that? It was a long time ago. That's how long I've been doing this. I received the promo. I was like, Amon Amarth. That was 1998. Wow. That means I've been doing this for 16 years? Yep. Oh, man. I really got to, like, buckle down. February 10th, 1998. Oh, that's depressing. That means I really got to buckle down and start actually making something of myself <laughs> you're doing nothing with your life george <laughs> yeah well the first few years the the website was not all that big of a priority it was more of a hobby it's still a hobby i don't make any money from it but i didn't spend as much time with yeah, it you and i weren't even hanging out then so it's it's okay those first couple of years don't even count exactly anything before you doesn't count <laughs> but yeah i got a promo for this and i was like huh all right Viking metal. Cool. It was actually a physical copy? Yes, it was a physical okay, copy cool. of the album that Metal Blade sent me. Cool. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I was just like, wow, you know, Viking metal. Cool. That's awesome. And so. Did you know that they took their name from Lord, Lord of the Rings? At the time, I did not. Okay. Obviously, I do now, but yes. Um, and so, you know, it has some uh, sentimental value to me, and that's why I put it in the number three spot. My number two spot is Deceiver of the Gods. You just dissed all over my number two. What? Why am I best friends with this guy? Okay, I don't know what your problem is. First of all, this is like the best sounding production the band has ever had. It's produced by my one of my favorite producers, Andy Sneep. And it's, it's I don't know, it's a really good album. And it, because of the production, you know, I've always hounded them about the production over the years. And with Deceiver of the Gods, I finally got the absolute perfect production that I've been looking for, and it blew me away. My number one album. If it's not freaking with Odin on our side, I'm going to lose my shit here. Surtur Rising. What? Oh, my God. I'm sorry. That's my favorite Amon Amarth album. Okay. Destroyer of the Universe, Slaves of Fear, and Live Without Regret. Those three songs right there are Fucking! Yeah. When we saw them on tour, they played this whole album, right? It was the first couple songs, right? Mm-hmm. It was amazing. It was. It was amazing. I fucking love that album. Yeah. It's a gr- I, I'm not going to say it's bad. You know, I, I rated over Deceiver of the Gods. Deceiver of the Gods has yet again better production than Surtur Rising, but I like the songs better on Surtur. But with Odin on her side, doesn't even make your radar... I only had three to choose from. What am I supposed to do? If I could choose them Please, all, I would. Send your hate tweets to at Metalheadspod. Okay. 
I love that segment. That's my favorite. You you love to bash me. <laughs> Jeez. I love that. <laughs> You're like, please tell me about bands, and then <laughs> fuck you. you. You you're stupid. You know what you're talking about. Yeah, I always bow to you. I just I like to say because that segment is where our styles, you know, really come into play. Yeah. So what's the convincing view for this week? What are you going to try and convince me on? As I've been talking about, it's going to be Exodus. Can I stop you right there for a second? And let's go back. I was in traffic leaving work the other day, and I put on Overkill. So you're getting to me a little bit. Excellent. So, just to go back in the episode, you're you're helping me out a little bit. It's working a little bit. All right. <laughs> yep, it's slowly working. So, this week's band is Exodus. Yep. But this time I'm giving you four because I'm going to give you two different eras. The first two songs are from Bonded by Blood, which featured Paul Bailoff on vocals. This is one of my favorite Exodus albums. The first song is the title track, Bonded by Blood. Fucking classic killer song. If you don't like this song, you can go fuck yourself. You <laughs> just get off my podcast. <laughs> this is ridiculous. If you don't like this song, get out the hell out of here. <laughs> Murder in the front row. Crowd begins to bang and there's blood upon the stage. Bang your head against the stage and metal takes its place. Bonded by blood. Fuck yeah. You're turning me on with those lyrics. Hell yeah. Then there's another song from the album. I wanted to give you just sort of a, a variety of the Bailoff. So the second song is And Then There Were None. You can check these songs out on the Middle Disciple Facebook mm-hmm. page so you can listen along. The next two songs are from the Zetro era. I'm working on the assumption that you are already familiar with the Toxic Waltz. I know it. Yeah, I, I, I love the song, but because I know you are already familiar with it, I was not going to include it. If you're going to listen to it again, then that's on you. <laughs> But from the same album, Fabulous Disaster, the third track to convince you is called Verbal Razors. It's a real, you know, Verbal Razors is about a song. It's just like putting somebody in their place by just, you know. Talking shit to them? Not talking shit, but just, you know, totally like, you know, maybe they're talking shit and you're just like, boom, you know, that perfect comeback. You're putting them, you know, Verbal Razors, cut you down to size. Yo mama. (laughs) It's a great song. Okay. And I figured, well, I might as well give you something new as well. You know, Normally, I give you all songs from one album. I'm splitting this up over three albums. The first two songs from Bonded by Blood. The third song from Fabulous Disaster. And this last song is from their new album, Blood In, Blood Out. And it's called Collateral Damage. I wanted you to hear the earlier sound of Exodus and then the newer sound. I skipped the Rob Dukes era because... Well, not that, there, not that there was anything wrong with it. Nobody cares, be honest. No, they do. It's it's not the bad stuff. Rob Dukes is a good singer. But for my purposes here, to turn you on to classic Exodus, these are the two singers that matter. So get on Facebook, check out these four tracks. <laughs> next week, Buke will come back with his response. Actually, it won't be next week. We won't be here next week. I'm out of town the Halloween weekend. But the week after that, we'll be back. And Buke will have a response. And we've been getting some feedback about the the past week, so thank you for that. Excellent. All right, so what have you been listening to? This is an interesting one, and I wanted to get your take on this. We mentioned this on the new releases of the week. Sanctuary, the year the sun died. Uh-huh. Maybe it's because I've heard so much Nevermore. Okay. I can't get Nevermore out of my head listening to this. Huh. You know what I'm saying? Does it sound like Nevermore to you? No, because Nevermore had more intricate out there solo work. Mm -hmm. I guess Worrell's voice is so one of a kind Uh that since I didn't listen to a lot of old Sanctuary, the only Worrell I can associate him with is Nevermore. You know, that's what I latch him on to. So when I hear this new Sanctuary, I'll mention this because this album fucking rocks. It's not super heavy. No. But it is in this vein of Sanctuary. It is very good as far as I'm concerned. It's very good. But I'm hearing Nevermore. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I, maybe I'd be the same way if I had been a big Nevermore fan. For, yeah. But for whatever reason, I was never a big Nevermore fan, so. The first convincing George show would be Nevermore, but... Yeah, the new Sanctuary album. If you ever heard Warwell Dane's solo album, this is a lot in the vein of that. I love that album. But man, this is a great album to listen to. It's just a classic metal album. It's not super heavy. 
If you ever heard Sanctuary growing up, it's just classic metal. Yep. Would you describe it the same way? It's just classic metal. It is. Yeah, it's just it's not it's not heavy. It's just I used to call it thrash, but I wouldn't call this thrash no. now. It's not super fast. The production value is great. Yep. I love his voice. He's a, he's one of my favorite front men in metal. I rec- walked into record store the other day and they were playing this, so I was all excited. But Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's a great album. It is. It really is. All right, well, my album this week, I can't tell you a whole lot about it, but I picked it up because of the singer. The band is called Voodoo Gods, and the album is called Anticipation for Blood Leveled in Darkness. I like that. And the vocalist is, of course, Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse, George Fisher. (laughs) I was like, what? I'm like, well, I got to hear this. And there's also some vocals from the guy from Severe Torture, and the bass player is... I don't know him by name, but I was looking at some pictures, and if I counted correctly, the dude has nine strings on his bass. So he is one of those like super duper bass player virtuoso guys. Yeah, and the drummer as well. So he's like the Les Claypool of metal, <laughs> I guess, man. <laughs> but you know, uh, I've been listening to this this past week, and it's it's good. You know, if you like Cannibal Corpse, I don't think it's a stretch for you to get into this album. So. Check it out. Voodoo Gods. That's a great recommendation. All right. What's your classic for this week? We were talking about it earlier. Thanks, Spotify, uh, months ago for turning me on to these guys. I know they're a classic in the German thrash metal scene. And I know you're you know, in your head right now. You know who it is. I, I know one of three guesses. Yeah. Sodom. Okay. I knew you were thinking it. Parade number <laughs> one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sodom, their album, Agent Orange, came out in 1989. Okay. This is when they started to turn a little bit more into the air quotes German thrash metal style from their earlier albums. Okay. Uh, It's just a killer album. Just a killer thrash album. You know, right in the vein of creator, you know. Destruction. Yeah, destruction. You know, the, the big three of German thrash. Exactly. You know. You know, tracks like Agent Orange, which is probably the most popular song, uh, Tired in Red, Remember the Fallen. Yeah, just, you, I know you've been telling me you've really been in the yeah, Sodom lately. Yeah. I've really been in the Sodom for a while. Ever since I found them on Spotify, I've just really been listening. And more so, modern Sodom mm-hmm. it's, has been great. Yeah. Excellent. So that's what I've been listening to this week. You know, Sodom is, has been great. And, and the guy I am who's always loved war theme stuff. A lot of this album talks about Vietnam theme stuff. Agent Orange, go figure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, are we ever a Sodom fan? Not, uh, not in the old days, not particularly. Okay. Uh, I, I've come to grow, or rather, they've come to grow on me over the years. Because but. I knew you were a creator fan. Yes. You just never. Yeah, I don't know. It's okay. just you know, you know, creator was always much bigger to me than destruction and Sodom. I've been listening to both Destruction and Sodom a lot more lately, and like I said, you know, they're growing on me. Mm-hmm. Maybe one time for my classic, I'll get into a creator, but when you turn me on to their pleasure to kill. <sighs> but dude, even their later album, oh, I'm trying to think of it, that has Enderama on it. That's Enderama, that's the album. Yes. They got a lot of crap for that album. I. Why? Well, I mean... It, it is very different from their origins, and it's very different from what they're doing now. But I agree. Taken alone, standing alone as a metal album, it's a great metal album. A great album. The album, I think it was the album before that, Renewal, they sort of did this, like, kind of, I don't know, they started doing like an industrial thing. But I kind of really liked that album, too. Before, after Renewal, there was Cause for con- Conflict. Oh, was it? Yeah. Really? There was that between them? Yeah. Re- Renewal came out in 92. Cause for Conflict was 95. Outcast in 97. And Enderama in 99. Huh. How did So there's two in the middle. That's interesting. And when did you get into them? And em- Endless Pain was 85. Pleasure to Kill was 86. Um, I, I My first album that I actually bought from them was this Extreme Aggression. I'd heard of them, mm. but... You know, in the 80s, it was hard to come by certain things. And so the first one that I was able to find was Extreme Aggression. Could you do a top three for for them? Not off the top of my (laughs) head, but if we thought about it, maybe next time. (laughs) That's why I love you. Okay. What do you? My classic this week is something that I recently picked up on vinyl. Okay. Surprise, surprise. I love your classics. This is the 1989 debut album from Atheist called Peace of Time. Hmm. 
These guys are a Florida death metal band. They kind of musically bridged the 80s thrash and the coming 90s death metal scene. You know, technically they're death metal, but musically they were really, they sounded a lot influenced by the late 80s thrash scene. And I just, you know, I picked up the vinyl a couple of weeks ago and I've been listening to it and listening to their other stuff and you know, just getting into it. So that's my classic for this week. I have never heard of them before. Never heard of them before. Ever. Ever? No, serious. Oh, wow. I just put them up on Wikipedia right now. Never Dude, heard of them. Get on it. Seriously. Right Seriously. This is it, right? There's a no. Yep, that's it. Yep. Never heard of them before. Listen to it on the way home. <laughs> Pull you it know, up on I, Spotify. Yep. Check it out. You know, everything you tell me, I do listen to. <laughs> so, right. uh, dude, this was probably one of, this is my favorite week we've, we've ever had. And this is definitely the longest podcast we've ever had. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we are going to close things out now. Make sure to check us out on Facebook. There's a MetalDisciple.com Facebook page. You can get a hold of me on Twitter, Disciple OV Metal. You can get a hold of Buke at Opeth Fan. Or at Buke at WeAreMetalHeads.com. You can get a hold of either of us on Twitter at MetalHeadsPod. As Buke mentioned, we're now on Instagram at MetalHeadsPodcast. We're on Stitcher. We're on YouTube. We're slowly expanding to every possible avenue of things. iTunes, uh, subscribe on iTunes. Have it show up on your device right away. And if you do listen to us, could you, I'm not saying leave a review, just leave a comment. Because I've seen with a lot of these sites, the more, you know, comments are out there, you know, the more it kind of bumps you up. So we're not asking, we don't care. Five stars, one star. We just want honesty. Yeah, let us know what you think. And, you know, hey, if we're doing something that you think is fucking stupid, tell us, you know. Maybe mm-hmm. we'll fix that shit for you. And uh, to Adam and Dan, who... Uh, Adam? Adam. Adem. A-D-E-M. Okay. okay. To Adam and Dan, who sent in questions for Brian, thank you. Yes, that's always helpful. To Brian Slagle himself. And he liked those questions. And I, yeah, he I, I, did. When you told me them, I was like, wow, these are both better than anything I have to ask him. Yeah. yeah. To Brian, again, thank you for taking an hour out of your day to join us. Yes, that was. it made our day. It made our freaking day, made our week, made our, our year. Indeed. So thank you to you, Brian. All right. We're about to get out of here. But before we do that, we're going to play you a third song from Aries. This is is Dogs of War. See you later. See you.